Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. My dad in 1978 was a Portland, Oregon policeman for 30 years. And once a year I went with him while he did his police work for a book report at school or something. I was 12. He worked on the graveyard shift, coming home at four in the morning, about seven miles north of Hubbard, Oregon. We lived down a gravel road about one mile from a school. It was all gravel, but it was long enough for two cars to go past each other. And we were just, you know, half asleep, but awake. He and I both saw something leap across the road as if it had already been running. It jumped onto the whole road, which was at least 10 feet wide. It didn't even step into the middle. It jumped off the edge of the ditch and right into the orchard next to where we lived. I looked at my dad and he looked at me. He was a very quiet man, but we just said, what was that about? We got to the house and parked the car in the driveway and we were both running trying to get through the door as fast as we could. When I went to bed that night, I felt like it was morning because I was so anxious. I told my sister that we're moving my bunk beds to the far wall away from the window. Afterward, I didn't talk to anyone except my mom and I didn't have any close friends and school was out. But then it happened again. A week later, a doctor in his small red Volkswagen drove down the same road towards town. He saw the same thing and was so scared that he stopped at the police station. Of course, that got out and it was written up in the paper and all that. It looked just like the Patterson one referring to the Bigfoot creature filmed by Roger Patterson, except that it had lighter hair. Back when my mom was in the hospital, I stayed with her for five days. She was on the sixth floor, whereas the food court and snack machines were on the basement floor. I live in a small town, so our hospital is the only one with six floors. I rode up and down the elevator so much that I knew this place like the back of my hands. Anyway, one day I went down to get a drink and a Kit Kat. Everything was normal except the Coke machine card reader didn't work. When I got off the elevator on the sixth floor, there were just empty walls. There are no nurses' stations, no rooms, no painting, no furniture, nothing. I walk towards one end to see random-sized white buildings, and the other end to see tall skyscrapers and a shiny metal window-type building. I called out over and over, but no one replied. I walked to the elevator stop, and they were missing. I took out my phone to call the hospital to tell them I was lost. But my phone didn't have any bars. This was years ago with flip phones. I kept looking at the windows hoping to find some sort of person to alert, but no one was down there. No cars for miles. After realizing I was literally screwed, panic attacks kicked in. I sat on the floor, staring at the wall, trying to calm myself down for a half hour. When I woke up, the place looked the same except for the elevators. They were back and I sighed of relief. I got in, pushed to the fifth floor of the maternity ward and the doors shut. When they opened, there were the basic light-colored walls, borders trimmed with cute duckies, and the sounds of people talking and babies crying. I found the fire escape and figured I'd take my chances on getting to Mom's floor. I opened the door and I was back on the sixth floor, the real one. I walked into Mom's room and she said that was fast. I told her I must have been gone for over an hour, but she said I had been gone for less than five minutes. I looked at the TV and the bold and the beautiful was still on as a 30-minute show. I don't know what happened to me or where I was, but I still don't trust elevators. This one time I was swimming in Lake Michigan. It was late at night and I just had a few beers before jumping off my uncle's boat for a swim. I was in the water for maybe five minutes and my uncle and cousin shined the spotlight on me. I will never forget the look of sheer terror on their faces and the yelling that ensued. I felt something slimy wrap around my leg and torso and I started thrashing violently. I managed to get back into the boat and on looking back I saw the biggest, meanest looking bunch of kelp I had ever seen. To this day no one knows what happened to my uncle and cousin.
I was asleep one night in December of 2012 at my home in Montgomery, Alabama. I had been experiencing a deep fascination with UFO phenomena, questioning reality, and a deep spiritual awakening. I felt as if I had had similar experiences in my youth to what I'm about to describe, but could never really remember details as I do with this episode. Keep in mind I'm a mother and a professional and do not want to be deemed as crazy. I have only shared this info with my husband right after it happened. I felt as if I was dreaming and I was back in my childhood home, several miles from where I actually was. In the dream I woke up and wandered outside as if I was being called to do so. I was then in my former neighbor's front yard. There was a silver disc with three wonderful human-like beings. One felt male and the other two felt female. This was a sort of telepathic feeling. I just sensed who they were and they felt familiar to me almost like meeting long-lost relatives. They emanated an incredible feeling of peace, love and other things that I just cannot put into words. They ushered me into the craft. We ascend straight up. I don't really know what was going on outside the craft, although it did not ascend by any means we know of today. The craft itself was operated by one of the female beings. The craft seemed to know her. The male and other female sat on either side of me. We had a deep conversation about life existence and our purpose here on Earth. We then arrived wherever where. I have no idea where. Again, just felt familiar. We exited the craft and we were inside of a building. There were many more beings of the same type. The area was large, very beautiful and bright. There was an enormous sitting area where we continued to discuss very deep subject matter. The other entities were also communicating. It was like a council or a meeting. I felt such incredible love that I did not want to leave. Suddenly they told me that I had to come back, that I would be okay and they would always be with me. I suddenly woke up in my bed. I dismissed it as a lovely dream. A couple days later, while checking my mailbox, I noticed a circular pattern in the grass in my front yard. The grass was bent over much like you would see in a crop circle. I asked my husband what it was, and he had no idea. Then I realized that the dream I had actually occurred and the craft had landed in my front yard. I told my husband about this, and of course he dismissed it. We only talked about it again recently. It came up in conversation and I said what could have caused the indentation, and I wished I had taken a picture to which he replied we should have had the soil sampled. He admitted that when I first showed him the first thought he had was UFO, and then after telling him the story he was so internally shaken up he couldn't think about it. On my boat 35 miles due east off the coast of Asbury Park, New Jersey left from Sandy Hook. Been fishing all day chumming the waters for blues and what have ya. It was sweltering hot and just my buddy and I with four poles out and hours have passed. We're sitting on deck chairs that put our head height just below the rear deck gunwales so our vision is trained on the poles and not our surroundings. Around 1 p.m. comes and the sun is just beating us up and my friend says, I'm so hot I'm going to jump in the water and starts to take off his shirt. I immediately tell him, no way are you doing that. We've been chumming for five hours now and it's a very bad idea. A shark will get you. I tell him take a gallon of water out of the fridge and to douse himself. So he goes to the galley, fetches the water and stands up in the aft cockpit and cools himself off and then comes back to the lower deck and plops back down in the deck chair and says, I feel much better. I then say, yeah, at least you weren't shark bait. And two seconds later, we hear the unmistakable loud bang of a gun. We both shoot up, and as we do, we hear another shot and yank our necks to the forward starboard where there is another boat we did not even know was there with one guy hanging onto a rod for dear life and another guy leaning over pointing a shotgun into the water while he fires off another round. After another 15 minutes or so they attempt to haul this beast lurking below into the boat. By now we know it's a shark, but the size and type is what really threw me off. It was a 9 feet bull shark. First off, a bull shark is a known human attacker, and surely would have gone after my friend had he jumped in and secondly, why was it so far off in deep water? 
It could have been the most unlucky coincidence ever. After consulting the water temp charts later that evening, it seems it probably followed the prevailing warm current so far offshore and doing so was definitely out of its normal hunting grounds and likely very hungry as they caught it on a six pound snapper as bait. It would have loved my 200 pounds friend to death. We fished together many times after that and not once did he ever mutter the thought of jumping in to cool off. We were hunting antelope in a very remote spot in the west desert of Utah. We were four hours drive from the nearest town and had camped several miles off the nearest road or marked trail. I remember it being the darkest night I've ever experienced. Could not see my hand in front of my face, but the stars were amazing. I awoke in the middle of my sleep to the sound of a low flying plane. We opened the tent to see a small plane coming in for a landing on the other side of a hill. We were scared out of our minds as we were in a spot probably few people have ever been in. An hour later we heard the plane take off into the night sky. We couldn't sleep after that. The next morning we climbed the hill and slowly peered over to see a makeshift runway there in the desert. We've tried to find the spot on Google Maps for years with no luck and still aren't sure what to make of it all. truck driver here. About a year ago, I was stopped at a Flying J in Indiana. There was plenty of parking, so I parked way in the back away from everyone else to enjoy the quiet. I took my dog for a run, took a shower, and went to sleep. Later on in the night, I started to have terrible nightmares. I can't remember the details, but it was seventh level of hell type of shit. Finally, I wake from my horror, and I just hear these hell beasts whining, screaming, and wailing. The most awful noises you have ever heard in your life. Confused and dazed, I roll around in the sleeper a little and try to get my bearings. I figure the sounds are part of my dream and I'm not really awake. Well, the nightmares and the sounds continue. Finally, I get out of the sleeper and check my mirrors. I see a livestock hauler parked next to me. Weird. He could have parked in a secluded area like I did. Most livestock guys do this anyways. I figure he's just got some hogs that are going nuts. I'm too tired to move my truck, so I go back to sleep. I wake up a little while later to the nightmares and sounds again. I have to pee, so I figure I'll get out and see what the hell is going on. I get up to the cab and see that the livestock hauler is gone, and the sounds have suddenly stopped. I start to question my sanity for a minute. As I open my door to get out, my dog wakes up and follows me. This is when I really start to think I might be going nuts. My dog was asleep for the entire ordeal. He never even flinched. He's also a border collie, so when there's livestock around he gets hyper and in a hurting mood. I take a leak, get back in the truck and go back to sleep. Was a really weird couple of hours. I'm from Mexico and I attended a university near Amarillo, Texas. The journey from Mexico usually took around 10 hours by car, and the route was predominantly characterized by sprawling ranches and picturesque forests. On one particular occasion, I made the decision to begin my drive from Mexico at 8 p.m., aiming to travel throughout the night and avoid heavy traffic. As the clock struck midnight, I found myself passing by a series of ranches near San Antonio. The surrounding landscape was serene and bathed in the pale glow of the moon. It was then that something unexpected unfolded before my eyes an encounter that would forever linger in my memory. A deer emerged from the darkness, gracefully crossing the highway directly in front of me. However, what set this sighting apart from any other was the peculiar way it moved. To my astonishment, the deer walked upright, using only its hind legs, resembling the gait of a human. I couldn't believe my eyes as I witnessed this extraordinary sight, a creature defying nature's expectations. As I processed the surreal scene before me, an eerie sensation washed over me. Suddenly, amidst the quiet solitude of the night, my mother's voice pierced through the air, echoing as if she were right there beside me within the confines of the truck. Her voice carried an urgent tone, filled with alarm and distress. 
Startled, I frantically scanned the vehicle, searching for any trace of my mother's presence. Yet the cabin remained empty, devoid of any physical manifestation of her being. Confusion and a sense of unease gripped my heart. I lived with my grandparents and my mother. Grandparents were out of town on a trip, and my mom had left for work an hour prior at 11 p.m. She works graveyard shifts. This was not the first time I'd stayed at home alone, but it wasn't a regular thing. You'd think I would have fun with it and make whatever food I want, browse online without being watched, watch whatever on TV and live the dream as a kid with freedom. I'm the opposite. On high alert, watching Disney Channel with the phone next to me. Eventually, I start to relax and get up to walk to the kitchen. Something is off. My basement door is always shut to avoid cold air coming into the main floor and it's cracked. Me being me, I panic and freeze in my tracks. I keep staring at it and see it move back and forth for a few seconds and see it slam shut. I freak the F out and run to get my flats and shoot out the front door. With my keys in the middle of winter, snow falling and it's fairly windy, I ran full speed down the street and around the corner to a family friend's house. I bang on the door and they answer and ask if someone chasing me and I said I don't know but I think someone's in my house. I'm beyond terrified so I called my mom from their phone and explained what happened while crying and struggling to breathe. I stayed over there that night and my mom picked me up when she got off work at around 7 in the morning. We go back to the house and investigate. Nothing weird when we open the door to go downstairs, but at the end of the stairs there's a water trail on the floor. Leads to the back door to outside and it's cracked open. It's unlocked, but it can't be unlocked from the outside because it's a sliding latch, and it didn't seem forced or broken so it must have been left open. There's footprints outside the door that are kind of covered from fresh snow, but you can tell someone was there and broke in. My mom didn't call the cops, although I wish she would have, but she's not one to look into things. I could break my wrist and she'd tell me to ice it and move on. Anyway, we called my grandparents and told them what happened. They were worried and glad I was okay. When they got back, my grandpa installed a nice dead bolt on the door. I'm 20 now and I'm still scared in my own apartment at night, but I made sure to get a place with nice security and made friends with the neighbors in case of emergencies. First story is about me heading to my middle school bus stop. I lived about three, four small blocks away from my stop in a small town. I had loads of energy when I was younger, so I would get up at 5.30 a.m. to get ready for school, and once I was finished, I would just head to the bus stop to hang out. It's still pretty dark outside once I start walking 6.30ish, and since it's a quiet town, I was never really scared to walk in the dark. One morning I was on my way there just minding my business, probably following cracks on the sidewalk and I hear grunting. Fast-paced, primal grunting. I looked around for a second and made eye contact with one of the homeless men in the area and he charged after me. I was probably 4 feet 11, tiny girl with a ponytail running to my bus stop, which is marked as someone's house and hid inside one of the bushes. It was still dark but I could make out a body walking around slowly as if he was searching for me. After a few minutes he leaves and I knock on the house's door and tell the owner what happened, and he lets me stay inside neighborhood watch homes or bus stops for kids, so I was fine until other kids get there. Told my mom wasn't allowed to walk there alone for months. I worked in a gun shop in Houston. One day this guy comes in and asks what is the process to buy a gun if he is not a citizen. We had to call the BATF to find out. He was a ship captain with a Panamanian passport. He needed a pistol. He had to get a letter from the Panamanian consulate and some export paperwork before he could buy it. We asked him why he would go through all this trouble. Turns out, in the middle of the Atlantic, one of the crewmen woke up the cook and asked him to make some coffee. The cook took offense and chased the guy down and cut off his arm with a machete. 
the cook would be on the ship on the return trip. On the evening of July 11, 2023, I walked outside my house to investigate why my neighbor's dog was wildly barking. I live in a small town in northern Minnesota. I went through the door at the side of my house that is also connected to the garage. Anyways, while I was standing by the side of my house, wondering what the dog was barking at, I looked to my right where there was a small empty lot full of grass and bushes and I saw something about the size of a Great Dane with large pitch black eyes looking at me. It was light brown, had long fur, and was standing in the grass about 30 yards from me. I think its face was like a monkey. Actually, it reminded me of a baboon, but there's no way that is what it was. Anyways, I'm almost 100% sure it wasn't a dog, cat, or anything else. I screamed so loud that my neighbors ran out and started to look for whatever it was. My neighbors grabbed his rifle and walked into the lot. After several minutes, he returned and said that whatever it was growled at him, but it was hidden in the bushes. He said the growl was unlike anything that he had ever heard before. He is a hunter and is very familiar with the local wildlife. Whatever it was could be heard running off. I called the local police and reported the sighting. Has anyone else reported anything like this? I need answers. I'm fearful that it may come back. I was riding back from a three-day stint out in the desert with my squad. We were assigned to protect a convoy that was carrying vital supplies for our own troops. I don't know what it was exactly, but they told us if anything happened to those trucks, then the war would have been even more devastating than what it already is. I just work as an officer, not some military strategist. Anyhow, being out there in the open desert with nothing but you and your squad mate is pretty disconcerting, at least to me anyway, with all these strange sounds coming from everywhere. One can easily get scared, especially during night patrols when everything falls deathly silent. Except it was not. As I was leading the convoy through our last night patrol for those three long days without any incident or trouble from anyone, we were just about to call off the guard duty and rest up for a little bit when it happened. It was me who spotted them first as my squad mates slept. As usual, I had to take watch. They weren't exactly hard to miss with all their lights and everything, but there were four of them. These big, bright metallic yellow orbs that kept following us everywhere even if we tried to hide behind the hills and other obstacles. Their position was given away easily enough. I told my team members, but they didn't believe me at first until they saw them too. They said these things must be scouts from an opposing military force. I was not so sure, and neither were they. We did not see any other military personnel that night. These things made their way to us slowly, but we remained calm. That is, until they began glowing brighter and more intensely. It then dawned on all of us what exactly these mysterious floating orbs were. The next thing we heard was a loud screeching sound coming from one of the things, and immediately after, another one started doing the same while two others remained silent. This went on for minutes before they suddenly sped off towards our base, which sat miles away from where we currently were. We did not know if whatever gave them such bright light had caused damage to our camp or worse, infiltrated it. And by the time we got there an hour later, everything seemed normal. We even questioned our commanders, and they confirmed that there was indeed a sort of strange light that came from the direction of where we were patrolling, but they did not know what it was. All I can remember is them telling us to forget about it, to get back to our homes, for we were dismissed by the higher-ups. It only took me a moment to realize what exactly those lights were before my squad mates told me that they were pulled in by their superiors, and they weren't lying. I'm a professional trucker named Merle, and my days are spent on the road, transporting goods across vast distances. On one particular night, I found myself cruising along a desolate highway in the heart of New Mexico. The darkness enveloped the landscape, and the only company I had was the hum of the engine and the occasional flicker of passing headlights. 
As I drove, my eyes caught sight of something peculiar in the distance, a pair of glowing lights. Curiosity peaked. I maintained my course, steadily closing the gap between us. The lights grew brighter, revealing the outline of a massive creature occupying the road. Its sheer size was astounding, standing at a towering nine feet. The breadth of its shoulders alone could span four feet, showcasing the immense power it possessed. Even from a distance, I could make out the details of its form. Stringy hair clung to its body, but beneath the wiry strands, I glimpsed the rippling of muscles, flexing with each movement. Its thighs were as robust as tree trunks, exuding an aura of raw strength. The creature's neck was hardly discernible, leading up to a conical-shaped head that seemed to merge characteristics of a gorilla and a Neanderthal man. Its long arms swung with an otherworldly grace, emphasizing the creature's uncanny blend of primal and humanoid traits. As I approached, my instincts told me to slow down, and I cautiously brought my truck to a halt. To my disbelief, I watched as the creature feasted upon a coyote, tearing into its lifeless body with a ferocious hunger. The sight was both awe-inspiring and disturbing, a primal reminder of the harsh realities that exist beyond our daily lives. Suddenly, as if sensing my presence, the creature's gaze snapped towards me. Its eyes locked with mine, and it emitted a bone-chilling shriek that pierced the night air. Without hesitation, the creature sprinted towards the nearby woods with a speed and agility resembling that of a human. Its departure left behind the grotesque tableau of a dead coyote sprawled across the road. I sat there in stunned silence, my heart racing as I tried to comprehend what I had just witnessed. After a moment, I mustered the courage to step out of the truck and approach the lifeless coyote. My curiosity overwhelmed my fear, and I inspected the remains, hoping to find some clue to the nature of this enigmatic creature. The torn flesh and scattered bones only deepened the mystery, leaving me with more questions than answers. An eerie chill ran down my spine, and a wave of trepidation washed over me. Hastily, I retreated to the safety of my truck, my hands trembling on the steering wheel. In that moment, I made a silent vow to myself, swearing off alcohol forever. The encounter with that creature had shaken me to my core. I'll give you my creepiest camping story. It was over 20 years ago in Southern Missouri. Me 17 and a friend 16 were out camping. We were at least a mile and a half from our truck. We were also at least two miles from the nearest farmhouse. We had set up camp in a small clearing in dense old growth. Clearing was only about 25 feet across. Our fire and lantern light reached the trees, but couldn't penetrate into them. It was dense and yet still had a lot of undergrowth. It was almost midnight and we were about to go to sleep when we started hearing movement near the camp. It didn't sound like a deer or coyotes. Sounded more like a heavy person walking around. We were armed, but we were getting really nervous. My friend called out, who's there? And the walking stopped. Then we heard, who, who, ah, ah, to one side. Then on the opposite side, we heard a very similar call. It almost sounded like something you'd hear a chimpanzee or ape make. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. My friend's eyes were huge and he mouthed, what the F was that, Ebony? I shrugged. I had no clue what that was. We were shining our lights at the trees, but even our flashlights couldn't penetrate the forest. My friend yelled out again, who the F is out there? And that's when it got even weirder. We heard the hoo hoo ah ah call again, but this time it was followed up with an ear shattering crack. It sounded like something was slamming a tree with another freaking tree. It was loud, about as loud as a rifle shot. Then it happened two more times just as loud. It did not sound far off, yet we still couldn't see anything in our lights. There was again another answering call from the opposite side of the camp. That one seemed to be coming from farther away than it did the first time, though. It also seemed to have moved around a little closer to the first one. We were still shining our lights around, but never did see anything. Didn't even make out any movement in the light. It was just too dense. We kept hearing movement in the woods, but it was moving away from us. After a little bit, all was quiet again. 
We never did sleep that night. The only thing I can equate the calls we heard that night are to a chimpanzee or an ape. It's the only thing I've ever heard that sounds similar to what we heard that night. Yet it wasn't exactly the same as a chimp's or an ape's. Those loud cracks we heard sounded like a wooden baseball bat hitting a tree, but way louder. I've heard cougars, coyotes, deer calls, and everything else native to southern Missouri, and still I had never heard this before and still haven't heard anything like it since. I still don't know what we heard that night. Probably never will. This happened back in 2011 to my dad. His job involves a lot of travel, so he's almost always driving alone from sunrise to early dawn depending on the time zone. When he stops at a restaurant around 8 in the evening he frequents, he places his things on a table and proceeds to the toilet. By the time he gets back to his table, he notices two servings of complimentary soup. He questions the staff why they place two bowls of soup when he's the only traveling. The staff puzzlingly replies that when my dad went to the toilet, a long-haired lady dressed in white exited the car and proceeded to the toilet as well. He just brushes it off, finishes his meal, and then continues with his travels, but not before one of the staff cautions him to be careful. While driving, a suddenly downpour obscures his vision, and just when he was about to make a curve, one of his front tires breaks off. Thankfully, he managed to control the car and manages to stop the vehicle, which was inches away from falling into a deep ravine. So it's 2 a.m., dark and raining really hard. He grabs a flashlight, searches for his tire, does some makeshift repairs, and hobbles the car to the nearest town for repairs. I don't know if the two events were related. When my dad told me about what happened, I immediately thought that he might have encountered a banshee, a spirit that heralds death. But it's a big world out there, who knows? I was about 10, 12 when it happened, can't remember exactly. I was coming home from school, and as I entered my building, an unfamiliar man in a black jacket followed me inside and started walking up the stairs behind me. I wasn't spooked out because I had lots of neighbors and often saw people I didn't know. The thing was, I live in a flat that is in the very top part of the building, and no one else lives on that level. So when the man didn't stop by the last flat below mine, I was immediately alarmed. But being a 10 or 12 year old, I didn't do or say anything and just kept nearing my flat, hoping that maybe he was an acquaintance of my parents. I don't recall exactly how I felt, but I know I was not nearly as terrified as I should have been. He was on the landing when I reached the door. I rang the bell and my sister opened. The moment the man saw that there was someone inside, he turned around without a word and started walking downstairs. Relieved as hell, I hurried inside. My sister 1517 at the time noticed the man and asked who that was, and I just mumbled I didn't know. We never talked about it again and didn't even tell our parents. It was only some time later that I realized just how badly it could have ended if the flat had been empty. Pretty sure we saw a dead body floating in the water once around 17 miles east of the Treasure Coast in Florida. We had just finished up a great day of offshore trolling for Mahai and were heading back in shore running about 25 knots. We weren't paying very much attention at the time as we were in the open water and primarily using the GPS for navigation. I'm not sure what caused me to look, but as we are cruising along I happened to look off the port side of the boat and saw a yellow blob about six foot in length floating on the surface of the water. I alerted the cat and we slowed down and turned around to go back and check. It was starting to get late and the sun was almost completely down. We were unable to find what I had just seen, so we continued our trip back to shore. Two days later, I saw an article in our local paper about a fisherman who had been recovered from the water, and he was dressed in yellow slicks with a yellow rain jacket when they pulled him from the water. I'm convinced his body was the yellow object I had seen on our trip. In 23, I saw the backside of a huge dog creature. 
I say huge, it could have just been a really big wild dog in the swamps outside Haines City, Florida. I only caught a glimpse of it, and it kind of looked like Scooby do the way it was running. It was about waist high to me, and I'm six foot six. The image I have of it in my mind is from the back, and it was like a tangle of limbs flying past me within ten feet. We had just got back from Christmas shopping, and I was helping my mom with getting my baby sister out of the car when the creature ran from my grandparents' backyard, which was directly on a causeway in a boating community. My stepdad yells, hey, and it flew past us. It was a blur as it went by. My stepdad got the best look at it before it got moving. He saw its face and all he's ever been able to tell me is that it looked like a big German shepherd. But in a literal 1.5 seconds, I saw it dive across what was easily an eight-foot ravine, both horizontally and vertically, up the hill and over an alligator-infested creek and into the bushes and trees and marshland on the other side. Then we shined a flashlight over there and could only see a reddish-orange glow of the eye shine. There was a street light pointing in the direction of the house, plus the porch light and motion light in the driveway there so it made it harder to see when it took cover. I could barely make out a big round head in the darkness, but I remember it seeming high off the ground for a dog. We stared at it for at least a full minute, and then it turned away and we went inside. I wanted to keep looking, but I didn't want to stand out there alone. True story, maybe not a cryptid, but I'm convinced they're real. The world is a strange place. I tightened my grip on my M16 rifle as we cautiously made our way through the dense, treacherous terrain of the remote island stronghold in Montenegro. Leading our highly trained U.S. Special Forces team was Jack, a seasoned veteran with nerves of steel and an unwavering determination. Our mission was critical. Infiltrate the stronghold controlled by a dangerous Russian terrorist organization, rescue a high-profile Ukrainian hostage, and prevent a catastrophic attack on NATO soil. The stakes couldn't have been higher, and every step we took brought us closer to danger. As we bypassed heavily armed guards and circumvented intricate security systems, the tension in the air was palpable. The adrenaline coursed through my veins, keeping me alert and focused on the task at hand. We were a well-oiled machine, moving swiftly and silently as we approached our target. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, we reached the heart of the stronghold. The room where the hostage was held captive was heavily guarded, but our training and precision allowed us to neutralize the threat swiftly and without raising the alarm. With our Ukrainian hostage safe, we set explosives to destroy the stronghold and eliminate any trace of the terrorist organization's operations. With the countdown ticking down, we made our way to a pre-designated rendezvous point deep within the woods. Fatigue weighed on our bodies, but our determination pushed us forward. Little did we know that an unexpected encounter awaited us. As we reached the rendezvous point, we caught sight of a creature unlike anything we had ever encountered before. It stood an imposing nine feet tall, with shoulders as wide as four feet. Its stringy hair offered glimpses of the immense muscles that flexed beneath its taut skin. Its thighs were as round as tree trunks, and its lack of a discernible neck accentuated its cone-shaped head. With long arms that swung with unnerving grace, I struggled to find the words to describe this hybrid creature, a terrifying amalgamation of half-gorilla and half-neanderthal man. Fear and astonishment gripped us as the creature locked its gaze on our team. With a sudden burst of speed, it charged towards us, driven by an unknown purpose. We unleashed a volley of rounds from our M16 rifles, aiming to subdue the beast, but our bullets seemed to have little effect. The creature endured the barrage, shrugging off the impacts as it closed in on us. Time seemed to slow as panic mixed with determination in our eyes. We fought with all our might, engaging in a desperate struggle to survive. But just as it seemed our fate was sealed, the creature abruptly turned and fled into the shadows of the surrounding forest. Its eerie, guttural growls echoed in the distance, leaving us bewildered and awestruck. Relief washed over us as the thumping sound of helicopter blades grew louder in the distance. Our extraction had arrived. 
As we boarded the helicopter and rose into the air, the question lingered in our minds. What kind of creature had we encountered? I was patrolling in my cruiser when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a man-sized lizard walking on two legs, crossing up ahead. It had shiny scales all over it, and it moved very quickly, like it was very comfortable walking on two legs without a problem. Its eyes were this fiery red color. It turned over to look at me, so I did a U-turn for it as soon as it disappeared, thinking this was just some freaking Halloween costume. I drove around aimlessly, checking every road and nook and cranny on the path before going off about where this thing had been seen. About an hour after that, just outside of Colchester County, our cruiser got attacked by what we think was the same lizard creature, except now it came from behind and shattered the back glass. It nearly almost got into the cruiser had it not been knocked off the car and shot at. After this happened, the weird things began happening to all the officers who experienced this. Bad nightmares, strange paranormal happenings at home. Then it became the entire police station. Everybody felt like they were under attack by some kind of demon or devil. There were only so many details to remember about these things. They kind of reminded me of gremlins or ghostbusters, except they were so gross and reptilian looking. The only one who seemed to understand at the time was our second to the chief officer, Schaefer. He had had personal run-ins with these things before, individually and by himself while hunting. And then other strange paranormal happenings began happening all over the police station. Even worse, things got increasingly violent, and I began fearing for my life. Even now, I feel like whatever that thing was had attached evil spirits to me and my fellow colleagues. Do you have any idea at all? I know you're just a YouTube guy, but do you have any idea at all what this could be or if this means anything? I'm just an officer who's desperate looking for help. One of my buddies is a private pilot, and this is my favorite story of his. A friend of his had to fly a small jet filled with half a dozen or so caskets that did in fact contain deceased bodies. Some family issues came up so his friend asked if he could make the flight for him. No problem, it's a quick flight with decent pay, why not? Once he accepts, his friend warns him not to take the aircraft above 30,000 feet. He's a bit puzzled but doesn't worry about it too much, and pretty soon he's in the air along with the least sociable passengers imaginable. Everything's going fine the first few hours, until he notices a heavy weather system building ahead of him. He keeps the same altitude of 30,000 feet for a while, but pretty soon the turbulence is just too much, so he says F it and hauls on up to 45,000 feet. No more turbulence, just smooth sailing at this point. A few minutes later, he starts hearing a strange noise coming from the back of the plane, a strange moaning sound almost, accompanied by the occasional bump. This is pretty sketchy because he's the only crew on the plane, and unless this is some World War Z shit, those passengers shouldn't be making any noise. But nevertheless, the strange moaning and bumps continue. He tries his best to ignore them until there is another bump, much louder than the rest, and a very intense moaning sound. He quickly looks back and sees one of the caskets is open with the person inside sitting almost completely upright. Well shit, this really is some World War Z mess. He just stares at the dead body moaning at him and hopes to God the man was a vegan and wants some grains instead of his brains. The more the body moans though, the more it slinks back into the open coffin. Now the 30,000 feet ceiling makes sense. The remaining air and the lungs of the bodies expanded as the altitude increased until they couldn't hold it anymore and some began to leak out in the form of the creepiest and least sexy moan possible. The one that sat upright expanded so much that his chest cavity actually became buoyant enough to partially lift his upper body. Once he realized this, he noped the F right down to 25,000 feet and never covered a flight for that friend again. My nickname is Detective Mark Smith. I'm a civil servant working in the South Carolina State Park Service Police Department. 
Recently, while on patrol at Sinti State Park, I encountered an individual who claims to be part of the Lizard Man Task Force. It was approximately midnight when dispatch had sent us to investigate reports of somebody screaming from inside the park. We immediately responded. As we neared the location where the screams were last heard, our vehicle malfunctioned, losing all power along with most electrical equipment. This forced us to continue on foot, following what appeared to be abandoned tire tracks leading into a heavily wooded area. The tracks seemed to belong to a mid-sized 4x4 or SUV-type vehicle. We continued on foot as the screams, sounding like a young child pleading for help from something unknown, grew closer. Suddenly, the screams ceased, replaced by the growling sound of an unknown creature. I caught a glimpse of yellow eyes staring at us before it swiftly ran into the night. It took about an hour to find another officer who arrived with a tow truck to pull our car back onto the road. We then contacted dispatch to have it towed away for repair. By now, it was 2.18 a.m., and we headed back to the station, feeling frustrated, tired, and somewhat scared. Upon our return, dispatch informed us of reports of another officer down, whom I'll call Officer James. Apparently, he had been attacked by a large, unknown animal. As we rushed to the scene, more screams were heard from a nearby neighborhood. People there were having their own encounters with this creature. We split into two teams, realizing the extreme aggression and danger this creature posed. Our equipment malfunctioned, causing delays in regrouping. Fortunately, all officers were physically unharmed, but shaken. They described an eight-foot-tall creature with glowing yellow eyes, resembling a giant walking lizard. When we fired at it, the creature growled in a demonic tone and disappeared into the woods. Realizing the abnormal nature of the situation, we knew we needed to reassess our approach. We discovered massive footprints near where Officer James had been attacked. He was seriously injured and had to wait for help to arrive. That night, we first heard about the beings linked to the Lizard Man sightings, which had occurred across the state over the years. After that night, the details become hazy in my memory. However, I found myself taking a friend into Santee State Park to show him something called the Ritual Site. He believed it was connected to the Lizard Men or some sort of cult. We ventured into the woods, reaching an area where the attacks had occurred near the Ritual Site. Suddenly, something large jumped out, with the same height and glowing eyes. It attacked my friend and knocked me unconscious in the process. When I woke up, I searched for my friend for hours, but he was nowhere to be found. Desperate, I approached a park ranger and explained what had happened. He suggested seeking more police assistance at the Santi State Park Ranger Station, as they were experiencing more encounters with this creature. When we arrived at the station, the sheriff explained that they had been receiving numerous sightings of the Lizard Man. It became evident that the creature was very, very real. In June of 1947, multiple ships traversing the trade routes of Malacca, which is located between Sumatra and Malaysia, claimed to have picked up a series of SOS distress signals. The unknown ship's message was as simple as it was disturbing. All officers, including captain, are dead, lying in chart room and bridge, possibly whole crew dead. This communication was followed by a burst of indecipherable Morse code then a final, grim message, I die. This cryptic proclamation was followed by tomb-like silence. The crews that received the message were able to triangulate the source of these broadcasts and deduce that they were likely emanating from a Dutch freighter known as the SS Aurang Medan. A merchant ship known as the Silver Star was closest to the presumed location of the Aurang Medan 400 nautical miles southeast of the Marshall Islands. Within hours, the Silver Star caught sight of the Orang Medan rising and falling in the choppy waters of the Malacca Strait. As the merchant craft neared the ill-omened vessel, the crew noticed that there was no sign of life on the deck. The men on the Silver Star began to call out in motion to the Orang Medan. There was no response. The captain of the Silver Star assembled a boarding party. The brave men boarded the ship and made a grisly discovery. The decks of the vessel were littered with the corpses of the Dutch crew. 
their eyes wide, their arms grasping at unseen assailants, their faces twisted into revolting visages of agony and horror. Even the ship's dog was dead, its once intimidating snarl frozen into a ghastly grimace. The boarding party found the captain's remains on the bridge, while his officers' cadavers were strewn about the wheelhouse and chart room. The communications officer was still at his post, as dead as the rest, his fingertips resting on the telegraph. All of the corpses, according to reports, bore the same terrified, wide-eyed expressions as the crew on deck. The temperature outside was 110 Fahrenheit, but the search party reported feeling a cold chill in the nadir of the hold. The captain of the Silver Star decided that they would tether themselves to the Orang Medan and tow it back to port. But as soon as the crew attached the tow line to the Dutch ship, they noticed ominous billows of smoke pouring up from the number four hold. The boarding party scarcely had a chance to cut the tow line and make it back to the Silver Star before the Orang Medan exploded with such tremendous force that it lifted itself from the water and swiftly sank. The crew watched the Dutch vessel disappear beneath the briny depths. So what exactly happened? Theories have ranged from pirates to the paranormal. The most widely believed claim is that seawater could have entered the ship's hold, reacting with the perilous cargo to release poisonous gases, which then caused the crew to suffocate. At this point, the onrushing salt water might have reacted with the nitroglycerin creating the explosive effect that was said to cause the ship's ultimate demise. The fact that there are no registration records for the Orang Medan remains a troublesome detail. There have been many claims that records may have been eradicated by a savvy group of governmental conspirators due to the nature of the ship's mission. Nobody knows what happened to the SS Orang Medan, except for the crew who now rest at the bottom of the ocean. I spent a lot of time stargazing as a kid, so one summer, my stepdad bought me a really nice telescope with a camera objective to look at the moon and stars with. One night we went out to the hydroelectric dam 40 miles from the nearest town to get some telescopic pictures of the Milky Way. The moon was out and about half illumination without a cloud in the night sky. We were out there until 1 a.m. and we were packing up the telescope and other gear when something with a simply enormous wingspan sped silently over our heads very quickly. It was pitch black and cast a shadow on the ground from the moonlight. It was gone in almost an instant. We looked at each other and both exclaimed in harmony, What in the F was that? I have never heard of any kind of aircraft with a wingspan that large or even one that could move in such complete silence. Even gliders make some kind of wind noise. We were far enough away from any airport or military base for anything to be flying that low. It was like something not of this world. It creeps me out to this day, some 20 years later. Last November, in the southern part of the Olympic Mountains, I embarked on a hiking adventure with my loyal dog. We had covered about 10 miles when we decided to veer off the established trail and explore the untrodden wilderness. The dense brush challenged our progress, but we pressed on, driven by curiosity. As we waded our way through the thick foliage, my dog abruptly stopped and began lowering himself to the ground. I was taken aback by this unusual behavior, as I had never seen him act in such a manner before. Instinctively, I followed suit and crouched down beside him trying to remain as still and silent as possible. In the midst of the tense silence, a sudden and distinct crunch shattered the tranquility, resonating from a point approximately 20 to 30 feet away. My heart skipped a beat, and I felt the adrenaline surge through my veins. My dog remained motionless beside me, his senses acutely attuned to the enigmatic sound. Time seemed to stretch as we held our breath, waiting anxiously for any sign of movement. Minutes passed, each one dragging like an eternity, until finally, a figure emerged from the wilderness, just twenty feet away from our concealed position. It was a creature, most similar to a Bigfoot. My eyes widened in disbelief as I witnessed the towering figure standing before me. The creature, often regarded as a figment of imagination, 
stood imposingly in the dappled sunlight filtering through the dense forest canopy. Without hesitation, the enigmatic being vanished into the depths of the woods, disappearing as quickly as it had appeared. I was a wild land firefighter for few seasons, so I spent quite a bit time far in middle of nowhere. Irony. I have began to feel way safer in middle of nowhere even at night than I ever do in a very safe city. But here was one thing that really stand out in my mind. One night we got assigned to watch the fire line. So we were spaced about 100 yards apart from each other and we were on hill. Plus it was night time and the fire was pretty much dead. Well or dead. We can see it in distance, but that is it. So we cannot see each other unless we flash light at each other. Anyway, I was sitting watching fire in far distance when I noticed something dark moving about 20 foot away from me. This wasn't unusual since a lot of animals roams around at night time. I slowly tilt my head down to look at it. I notice it was oddly shaped. I sat still and try to make out what it was. After some time, I cannot figure out what it was. I turn light on, saw a huge eyes, somewhat diamond-shaped head with massive ears. With ashes flying all over the place and odd tint of the light, the object looked like a goblin. I swear my eyes was bulging out of the socket as I saw this goblin. I sat still for a bit trying to decide whether I should scream or not. I went to school in a very remote area near Mont St. Helens. There's a trail used by the biology class, natural resources class and cross country team that leads to a water tower up on the hill. It's heavily wooded and kids go up there almost every day. My buddy and I were waiting for his big sister's softball practice to finish up after school so she could drive us home. In the meantime, we hiked up that trail. We hiked to the top and on the way down got a very uneasy feeling. We both felt it. The kind of eerie that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, like we were being watched. We continued on, but neither one of us felt comfortable. Something wasn't right. We just wanted to get off the hill and out of the woods. All of a sudden, we heard the loudest, freakiest scream directly behind us. We both froze. I still to this day have never been so terrified. I looked at my buddy who was completely pale. I couldn't talk. All he mouthed was, do, not, run. He mouthed the word cougar to me. I hadn't heard a pissed off cougar before that. All I can describe it as is a blood curdling screech from hell. We saw a few people walking towards us around the bend, which must have spooked the cat. We told the group to turn around. Rumor has it the cat had a den under the stadium bleachers don't know if it was true or not. We never did see it. I drove for a delivery service for two years delivering grocery bags that people ordered. Deliveries were between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. One night I was out late because I had a long distance to drive for my last delivery of the night. I was out in more or less in the middle of nowhere, rather deep into a forest, and arrived at four houses on a small road. After the delivery, I turned back on the road. It's late November, so it's very dark outside. As I make a 90 turn on with the road, my headlights clearly lit up a figure of a lady in a bright white dress, standing in the ditch on the side of the road. I probably only saw her for a second and couldn't make out a face, but I swear I saw her starting to move towards me. I drove out of there with lightning speed. Between the cabin and the storage space in the back, there is a door for passage. It's completely empty back there and dark. I had to spend the full 45 minute drive back, continuously waving the motion detected lights on back there cause I just felt this eerie presence back there while it was dark. That was the last time I ever had a delivery to that place on that route. One time and one time only. When I lived on a farm, one day I went up to fix a fence that a tree fell on. It was just a routine task, nothing out of the ordinary. The sun was shining and the air was filled with a familiar sense of the countryside. 
Little did I know that this day would forever change my perspective on farming. As I worked diligently on repairing the fence, the only sound accompanying me was the occasional rustle of leaves and the creaking of the old wooden posts. But then, a distant and rhythmic beat caught my attention. It was faint at first, almost blending with a natural symphony of the farm. I paused, trying to identify the source of the sound. It sounded like drums, distant yet persistent. Kind of freaky, I thought, but I brushed it off as my imagination playing tricks on me. After all, farms can be filled with peculiar sounds and unexplained phenomena. Determined to finish my task, I focused on mending the fallen fence. Time passed, and the beat of the drums continued to echo in the background, growing slightly louder with each passing moment. Suddenly, without warning, a massive figure burst out from the thick bushes nearby. It was an ostrich, running at full speed, its long legs propelling it forward with incredible speed. My heart raced as I watched the creature charging straight towards me. Well, F that, I thought to myself, instinctively leaping onto the quad bike parked nearby. With a surge of adrenaline, I revved the engine and zoomed away, leaving the furious ostrich in my wake. I could hardly believe what had just happened. The speed at which that bird was closing in on me was astounding. It was as if it had a personal vendetta against me. Moment later, the F was right beside me, pecking at the thumb that rested on the throttle before slowing down and eventually stopping the chase. Shaken but relieved, I realized that this ostrich must have escaped from an ostrich farm in the next valley. The distant drumbeat I had heard earlier was perhaps a sign of its restlessness or longing for freedom. That day, as I reflected on the encounter, I couldn't help but feel a newfound respect for the unpredictability of farm life. It was a reminder that no matter how well we plan and try to control our surroundings, nature can always throw us a curvy ball. That might have been the day I decided that farming wasn't for me. The incident with the ostrich opened my eyes to the unexpected challenges and dangers that came with agricultural life. Eva Trent had fallen asleep when she awoke to a buzzing sound. Opening her eyes, she was horrified to find two strange creatures standing on either side of her bed. The entity to her right was about seven, eight feet tall, weighed about 300 pounds, had apparently no clothing and seemed to have either crocodile or snake type skin. The creature to her left was identical in appearance, but smaller in height and weight. They seemed to be communicating in a chirping manner. Each of the entity's eyes glowed. Eva quickly discovered that she was unable to move. As she stared at the two creatures, she found that either one or both were giving her instructions telepathically. The nature of this was seemingly for her to create mentally visual scenes of various kinds, and then they proceeded to distort that particular pleasant scene in a perverse manner. Apparently the creatures were intent not only to observe her emotional reaction, but also possibly to feed off the energy that was produced. After a while, Eva began to mentally resist the mind manipulation and began to pray earnestly. A short time later, she fell back to sleep. The next morning, the witness found five of her music tapes grossly distorted as if extreme heat had been applied. However, no evidence of fire or odor was present. I was 11 years old, and it was the first time I was home alone late at night. And obviously, like all great scary movies, it was thunder and lightning out on this specific night. So I'm sitting in my living room watching TV trying to pretend like I'm not terrified. Ignoring the lightning and thunder when I hear it for the first time, a bang on my front door. It's loud and immediately my heart stops. I try to ignore it and go back to watching TV when again another bang. At this point, I'm shitting my pants. I don't know what to do. I'm 11 years old, no cell phone to call anyone, and if I get up to use the landline, I have to walk right past the front door. This goes on for literally like an hour, just loud bangs on my front door. Sometimes just one, sometimes a couple in a row. Finally, I'm like, F it. I'm making a beeline for the phone and calling my paps, seeing when he's gonna be home. I sprint past my door in hopes whoever the murderer at my front door is. 
Won't some home see me cross the hallway 10 feet in front of him and dial my dad? Tell him what's happening so he comes home right then and there. I sit in fear frozen next to the phone for until he gets home. He finally comes home and lets me know the reason I've been shaking in fear for the past hour. It is because I forgot to close the screen door and it's been swinging in the wind off the house back and forth, F me right. He still makes fun of me from time to time about it. When I was 16, around 20 years ago, Dan, I'm old. I was an angsty teen and my dad wanted to go camping with me to reconnect. He let me invite a couple of my friends and we camped out in this groomed spot that was adjacent to a neighborhood. It wasn't a real camping spot, so to speak, more like a wooded area in a populated area that was carved out for recreational camping. I call it city slicker camping. Anyway, we made camp and had dinner. Later that night, an argument broke out between my two friends and I took one of them Nick out with me on a walk to cool off. It was around midnight and while we were in a relatively populated area, my friend brought along a replica gun as a form of protection. Being a replica, it couldn't really protect us, but we figured that if we ran into some unruly people, we could scare them off with it very stupid, I know. Well, during our walk, we somehow made it out of the camping area and made our way into the adjacent neighborhood. By this point, it was getting really late and we had been walking for a good hour and a half. Earlier, we had passed by what looked to be an old elementary school when Nick started telling me ghost stories to freak me out. It worked. This went on for a little while until I got so freaked out, I wanted to head back. Because I was a scared little girly boy, I demanded the gun from him and we decided to head back. By this time, it was closing on 2 a.m. and we were passing by the elementary school again. Just a quick for your information, we were walking on a paved street. We decided against walking on the sidewalk because we were rebels and there was zero traffic out. Anyway, as we passed by the school again, we both heard a ringing sound. I had no idea what it was at first, but it was a little ways behind us. We both turned around at the same time, but saw nothing. We were thoroughly spooked by this point and started walking really fast back to camp. We were still a good hour and a half away, so we had a long way to go. As we walked faster, we heard the ringing again, but it was much closer. Judging by the sound, I figured it was around 20 or 30 feet behind us. We both stopped in our tracks and looked at each other. It wasn't a planned move, but I think since we were so spooked already, we didn't want to just turn around. We had seen enough horror movies to know what happens when you just turn around after hearing a creepy sound. After making eye contact, we slowly turned our heads to look at whatever was making the ringing sound. We saw a little girl, not more than 10 years old, riding around on a bike. She didn't look supernatural or anything. She looked real as any other little girl, but she was wearing a very thin dress and she was riding a bike around in circles. I had come to the conclusion that the ringing sound was from a bell on the bike. It was relatively cool out and I had a hard time staying warm wearing a thick sweater and hat. This girl was in a pale dress frilly and was riding around on a bike at close to 2 a.m. Spooky as hell, but since she wasn't see-through or have glowing eyes, we kinda relaxed a bit. We both turned around and started walking again, but after a few seconds I heard the ringing sound again but it was really close to us at this point, like right behind us. I turned around very quickly to ask her one simple question. Why are you riding around at night following us? But no one was there. It was like as if she just vanished into thin air. Sounds corny as hell, but hey, that's what happened. I turned around and from what my friend tells me, I was as white as a sheet. I guess he knew something was wrong and he just started sprinting. I was already thinking the same thing, so I was right there with him. We made it back to camp in nearly half the time it took us to get out there in the first place. All the anger from the previous argument had subsided, and it was just us recounting our ghostly tale to my dad and buddy. Good times were had after that, but I will never forget that experience. I'm sure there is a logical reason behind what happened, but it's still fun to think about it, and on occasion, it still creeps me out.
I live in the middle of the nowhere like, get Google Maps up. Zoom out four times before you see anything but green around my house in the UK. My house is also over 300 years old, and I have a couple things to share. I'm self-employed, so I spend most of my time alone out here while my mum, who I live with the house is legally mine now, but I also grew up in it, is at work. None of this is supernatural at all, just creepy country folk. So I'll start small. There are the old foundations of some stone houses up on the hill behind us, dug right into the rock, the same rock our house is made of, incidentally. Me and my childhood BFF used to hang out up there in what we imagined to be the basement of this long-gone house. All that's left are some eroded stone steps down and the indentation in the hillside of the basement or foundations. We didn't do anything, really, except sit and talk. We went up there every day for weeks one summer, and then one day, we both get this very powerful sense of dread that we shouldn't be there. We both said in our own way that the fairies didn't want us there, huh? British kids like. I know I at least could almost feel the force of someone's dislike for my presence shoving at me. And then suddenly, we're just running. I honestly remember very little we were sitting there, suddenly freaked out, and then hurtling down the hillside across two fields, over my garden gate, and inside the house in what felt like seconds but had to be minutes. I must have slipped at some point because I had sheep poop streaked all the way up my side, but I don't remember falling. LMAO, I'm 27 now and I flat out won't go to that place, I'll go around it, I'll go near it, but I am not stepping foot in what I feel like are its boundaries. Never again. 2. We've had search helicopters hovering low all around us and over the wood for nights in a row, and have never been told what they're doing. Spotlights the works. Nothing on local news. Sometimes I can't help but feel like there is something going on there other times I think nah, it'll just be training ops. I don't know. Seems like an intense training op, if so. And at 11 p.m. 2 a.m. 3. Another time we went walking in the woods, as we often did when I was younger, and found a dirty mattress just lying there in the dirt. Thing is, this wood is not bordered by any roads at all, nor do any pass through it to get a mattress deep into it like that. You have to park half a mile away from the tree line and drag it over at least two fields, including climbing the fences, and then up a hill through densely packed trees and brambles. No idea why someone would do that. I mean, I know getting laid is a big deal and all, but there are other woodlands around here closer to the road. Often at night, something will land very heavily on our roof and scrabble and skitter across the tiles, not like talons scraping, which we're used to, but the skittering of a four-legged mammal. It's loud enough to wake us both up and spook the cat badly. There's really no way for anything that doesn't have wings to be landing on our roof, though no trees overhanging at all. It'd be easy enough to climb the gutters, but this thing sounds like it's landing from a height. All I can think is that owls are dropping the feistier rats they catch on our roof by accident. But it seems like a stretch for that to happen so often. Can't comfortably explain it, gives me the creeps. On nights after I've heard it, I'm always more reluctant to go outside after dark. 3. Some sort of beetle or something has been eating my window frame, like chunks of the wood are missing. I hear it start to click away at it at night. But when I open my shutter and try to spot the little bugger, there's nothing to be seen except the bite wounds on the wood. 4. We had a neighbor, three fields over, who was a big-time child psychiatrist in the 60s, but who, when she was at her conferences, used to leave her son outside alone in the car for six, seven hours at a time in all weathers. The pair of them both creeped me the F out well, he still does. She collected dolls like a classic horror movie weirdo, and had UV-sensitive skin so had to wear a raincoat, elbow-length gloves, a sun hat and shades and all weathers literally couldn't have been better nightmare fuel for a child. One time I cycled past her house, and she was just standing, full raincoat, on her doorstep with her arms outstretched, and her head down, face hidden by the hood of the coat, perfectly still. But in truth, I think she was actually harmless, just a little weird. Her son, though, turned out to be an S offender, if you know what I mean. Five young victims that we know of, after his mum died, 
and he still lives in her house, two fields over. Sure does feel safe. 5. A little girl walked up and down the nearest road calling for her daddy. Not distressed, just like a bored kid who was being kept waiting. But I have no idea who she was nobody around here has children or grandchildren. Went to find the closest neighbor's number so I could alert them, and she was gone by the time I'd finished speaking to them. 5. Guy closest to us, one field over, has had his hunting dogs taken off him by the RSPCA three times. He keeps them in a tiny sheet metal shack with no outdoor access except once a week or less when he takes them hunting. He keeps managing to get more despite the court order, and you can very often hear him screaming at them and them yelping. To end on a light note, I have really disturbed sleeping habits so tend to work from 7 p.m. 5 a.m. most days, and will usually still be awake until 6, 7 a.m. One such morning in October last year, there's a very heavy frost, a light mist. It's just early enough for the birds to still be quiet in the trees. I'm riding upstairs and I hear this long, low, guttural bellow. Nothing like a cow. All I can describe it as is it sounded like the sound effects they use for dinosaur noises in Jurassic Park. Silence. And then another bellow, this one louder and longer. I'm quietly freaking the F out because in 26 years in the countryside, I know my animal noises and I've never heard anything like this. For a surreal moment my brain just can't fit that noise into any sensible form of reality and I actually, seriously, honestly believe some sort of time-slipped dinosaur, or F, a stranded alien, is injured or dying in our field. The bellowing sounds again, this time ending in a high-pitched wail, even more like a movie dinosaur than before. I carefully make my way downstairs and outside into the garden, which would definitely get me killed in any horror movie. I don't know what I was thinking. I tiptoe in the direction of the noise now a series of low, throaty rumbles, rather like a bear totally ready to find myself at the center of a major world event, or else a major government cover-up, and I see. A stag. It was a stag. His harem. Had strayed and he wasn't happy about it. It was a stag. I feel certain that most Americans would have already guessed that. But man, in the UK to see deer in the wild is honestly very rare outside of certain limited locations. They're the only deer I've ever seen around here, let alone herd. And he was. Amazing. Like, I'd only ever seen stags like that on postcards and in documentaries. Breath steaming in the cold, huge rack of antlers, head tipped back all the way and just yelling at the sky. As though a deer of female deers turn out to be around the back of my house, hence him aiming all of his unearthly bellows in our direction. And I just stand and watch, stunned, as the three of them bounce over the fence and rejoin them, and they all just melt into the tree line. My ship pulled into El Salvador, I believe it was, maybe one of the neighboring Central American countries for fuel, but that's beside the point. As we are pulling in, I'm on the bridge wing as bearing taker using an alidade to shoot bearings through a slightly magnified lens. It's absolutely dark out aside from our navigation lights, and the few dim lights near the pier, so my sight was pretty adjusted to the dark at this point. I happened to see something catch my eye in the sky, maybe a mile and a half off our starboard side, moving towards land at an altitude probably around 1,000 feet. It looked sort of like a B-2 stealth bomber, but more triangular. There were zero light emissions coming from it, and it was absolutely silent. Imagine a giant black triangular kite. That's what it reminded me of. It was moving around 200-300 miles per hour, if I had to guess. I watched until this dark shape against the starry backlit sky was too far into the distance to see it. After we tied up, I asked my friend who was the port-bearing taker and the lookout if they saw it, and they both said no. That was the freakiest thing I've ever seen, and maybe truly consider it to be a UFO. I'm a trucker, and I just want to tell my story. Some years back, I was driving home from work. I was a little tired, and focusing on staying awake. 
At one point during the drive, I look over and see a girl in the passenger seat of my car. She was probably early teens, pale, long black hair, wearing a white dress and an absolute blank star on her face. She looked over at me. It scared me to the point where I just sat straight up, suddenly wide awake, looked back over and she was gone. Had I not seen her, I possibly would have fallen asleep at the wheel. Ghost Girl probably saved my life that night, so thanks I guess. I suddenly awoke, sensing a distinct presence in the bedroom. Initially, I assumed it was my daughter entering the room. Opening my eyes, I glanced towards the side of the bed, where I witnessed an entity standing in front of the wardrobe. It faced me and my sleeping wife, emanating a soft, dull bluish glow throughout its body. The entity possessed human-like characteristics, with a small head featuring a pointed chin and a bald, domed shape. Its thin neck supported a barrel-shaped body, while its flexible arms moved slowly in a manner reminiscent of Tai Chi movements. The glow surrounding it obscured its facial features, yet it emitted an aura of tranquility. As the entity appeared to gaze towards my daughter's room, it suddenly reacted, turning its head slightly in my direction. With a smooth motion, it extended a hand towards me, its fingers spread wide. From its palm, a pale ball of light gracefully leaped towards me in slow motion, striking me squarely between the eyes. My last memory was that surreal moment, and then I found myself in broad daylight, with the strange entity vanished. I have had disabling migraines for the past 15 years. I realized I was addicted to Xanax and Valium and anything to stop the pain and keep me functioning. Eventually I crashed. I had to stop working, I couldn't read or go into any stores. I lived downtown in big city and wore earplugs to leave my building because the noise was too much. I created a sort of isolation booth for myself. I still more or less live in it. Strangest things I've seen. No. Strangest sensations I think are more like it. I've had moments when I was so starved for human interaction, but couldn't handle the stimulation I would lay in bed holding a body pillow with blackouts drawn, earplugs in, and an eye mask just in case. Sometimes I'd lay for days. Often I didn't have enough cognitive function to feel anything but hunger. I have lain in bed and cried because I couldn't heat up a microwave meal. It is an odd sensation to be hungry, have food available, and be starving. Not anorexic. Incapable. The next is that I don't exist. Time doesn't exist. I forget what month I'm in. I forget what I had for breakfast, or if I had breakfast. I've had bills go to collection because they sat and sat. Not procrastination, but again, my cognitive function drops low enough it's like being a zombie. When I have moments of clarity, it's like being dropped in a war zone knowing you probably don't have time to leave entirely so you strategize what the next best possible foxhole is. Not existing I forget to check my phone. I lose it. I haven't talked to anyone in days. My mind starts sort of swooping. I remember random encounters with strangers that must have been my last human contact. Vividly accounting for the head nons I made as I walked down the street toward the subway. Two drug dealers, I know them, two college kids, bright clothes, a Latina woman standing next to me on the platform. I remember when cognizant that I was staring, and she gave me a slight smile, and I felt like that was such radiance. So, clearly more than just isolation. But I've learned that my brain is powerful in ways that I try to find interesting rather than frustrating. My experiences make me feel like I'm in a sort of matrix walking through people who felt as real to me as mannequins and stick to such odd schedules. If this didn't make any sense, sorry. Early 2000s I was traveling a remote highway in eastern Nevada close to the Utah border when I saw some lights in the horizon. I assumed they were lights to some mine and thought nothing of it until I had gone another 20 miles and realized they were still there. I pulled over to a gas station and asked the lady if she knew what the lights were from. She does not answer me. 
only turns off all the lights and then picks up the phone to call someone and tell them they're back. All of a sudden, various groups of people start showing up walking from either direction in the highway to congregate at the gas station and stare off silently toward the horizon. Where these people came from I have no idea because I had not noticed any houses. I simply made my way back to the car and discreetly went on my merry way wondering what the F just happened. Once I went out to go to a drive out in our 80 acre land, about half of that land is pure swamp land. The rest of it is fields and pasture. We were doing it on my grandfather's land since we own land, but it is only two fields. We go hunting on this land every year, but we have never done drives. When I usually go hunting, I went with my dad since I was too young to go alone. But these last two years, I have become old enough to where I can hunt alone. See, we went on our drive since we now had enough people. I instantly regretted saying yes when my dad asked me if I wanted to do a drive. We live next to an Indian tribe. They are civilized but are known for trespassing. That has nothing to do about the story, but that's why I instantly regretted it. So we went. I had my 223 caliber in my hands. I was alone and in the middle of the swamp. It was winter, icy and cold. As soon as I entered, I slipped. It hurt since my back landed on a log. I went on, though. A couple of minutes later, I hear a voice. It sounds like my dad's, but it sounded weird. I called him on the walkie-talkie, and he responded, talking very quiet. But I could still hear the voice. It was becoming louder. I continue on thinking that it's just my head playing games while I was wrong. I walk forward a few feet and freeze. I saw someone, or something because it sure wasn't human-like. It was very tall and slim, and as soon as I looked at it, it ran very fast. I ran the opposite way. Told them to get out of there, they did. I called them to regroup and told them what I saw and heard. I never went into the swamp again. But I still go hunting at the land and never saw it since. This gives me nightmares till this day, and that was two years ago. Could it be a Sasquatch? I am a photographer and I love shooting creepy old stuff in the middle of the night. In the middle of nowhere, I am always alone. One night I am at the old, deserted ruins of a fort in West Texas working on a western series. The site covers many, many acres and is mostly just fallen walls and piles of rubble. The history of the place includes an Indian massacre, unmarked graves, and other assorted creepy factors. This in and of itself is nothing to me. As I said, I do this sort of thing often and never experience anything like I did that night. As I pulled into the site, I was immediately struck with a feeling of dread and doubt about the shoot. Just five minutes prior, I was full of excitement and vigor. I had been traveling for hours to reach this desolate place and was glad to be getting close. I shake off the feeling of dread and toss back a five-hour energy. I had been awake at this point for 20 hours. It was nearing midnight. I gathered my equipment, which consists of a compass, a tripod, camera, and a small light. Oh, also a 30-30 rifle. It's a Western series with a few selfies. I begin walking into the footprint of the old fort. It is a warm night, but I am feeling uneasy. I have goosebumps and my short hairs are standing on end. This is an alien reaction for my normally cool demeanor. It is nothing for me to walk through a forest at night, flashlight, or moonlight. Anyway, I find a spot I like and start to set up for a shot. I hear a noise. Not a big deal, I think. It's just an animal. Seconds later, I hear something that sounds like a whisper. It was muted, even for a whisper. There was nothing to make out. This time I dismiss it as an auditory hallucination, which I know could be likely given the number of hours I have been awake. All this time my heart is pounding, and wave after wave of chills, doubt and dread are passing through me. Still, I have traveled for hours and I decide this is a test of my mettle, and I won't let fear get to me and ruin this shoot. Even though I had determination on my side, my hands were shaking, and I could not think clearly. The shots are difficult and require some camera setup, 
which I could not seem to get right. Normally, I see a shot and instinctively know where to set ISO, aperture, color temperature, etc. Fast forward three minutes. I get one crappy shot, maybe two. I take a deep breath and walk to another spot. I hear the whisper again, this time behind me. I turn quickly, light in hand, and there is nothing there. Gathering every ounce of willpower, I walk, slowly, to the next spot, whispers in tow. I stop, and I am shaking at this point. I set up for the shot. The whisper has turned to whispers, and they surround me. I am trying to play this off as tricks of the mind due to lack of sleep, but my self-pep talk is not working anymore. I reach to press the shutter button, a cacophony of whispers surrounding me, and it was then that I felt very clearly the weight of a hand on my shoulder. Needless to say, that was it for me. Shoot was over, and I made haste to my car and got the F out of there. I found a convenience store that glowed like a white beacon in the night 30 or 40 miles down the road. I had coffee and collected myself for half an hour. About an hour later, I was in an old cemetery taking photos, and I was completely at ease. Was it fatigue? Maybe. But none of it carried over to the rest of the night. I won't go back to that fort alone again. My family has a summer house on a large remote island. Our place is in the most lightly inhabited part, and to get to it you either have to sail or fly, and then either hike over extremely steep terrain so steep that on the downhill side one has to hang onto trees and bracken and go hand over hand and half slide down for about three hours or travel for around 40 minutes in a little open topped boat at high tide. There are no roads or utilities. There are some other houses around, but they are far apart and one has to walk through thick bush on tiny narrow tracks for at least 10-15 minutes to get to a neighbor. There are no lights, and while the stars and moon are very bright, on a cloudy night, you literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. It's incredibly remote and mostly incredibly idyllic. Long childhood summers running wild through the forest and playing in the streams. There are some incredibly creepy things about it, though. Story 1. There is a grave at the entrance to the river. It's been there since the 1800s and is a light-colored stone with a white picket fence around it. The woman buried there was one of the original settlers of the area. When I was a child, the grave had fallen into disrepair. Strange things started happening all around the houses in the area. Doors slamming without a breeze, funny noises, taps turning on and off by themselves, little things going missing and weird problems with boat motors with no explanation. After a while, the community got sick of it, and someone suggested it had something to do with the grave. After laughing it off, everyone decided it wouldn't hurt to clean up the grave. They went out one day, weeded, scrubbed the stone, painted the fence, said a few words, and all the weird happenings stopped. Story 2. There are places that just feel wrong all over the area. There are no dangerous creatures on the island other than potentially wild pigs and it's always the same places. It makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck to walk through them, even in groups, and more than a few times I've sprinted dangerously on narrow, dangerous tracks when walking by myself at night just because I'm freaked as hell by the sense of fear and dread. And I'm almost 30 and not at all afraid of the dark under normal circumstances. It's not just humans either. I got a new dog. I was walking along a track with him in the middle of the day in bright sunshine, and we were maybe one men from one of these creepy places. Suddenly he stopped dead and he tensed up, stared right down the trail at the creepy area and started growling and barking and backing away. He got to the point where he was pressed up against my legs, tail down. As I was reaching down to touch him, he let out a sound that was crossed between a scream and a bark, ran around me and dashed off back the way we'd come. I turned around and started sprinting too. I found him at the house cowering under a bench. Ever since, he's absolutely refused to even go to the start of that track. I'm a night owl. I always stay up late at night and watch TV. I just happened to look out my window one night and saw what I initially thought was a man sitting on a roof. 
I thought it was a man because at first he looked almost naked until I saw the hair or fur on him. He then turned his face and what I saw then was frightening. He had pointed ears like a dog and a long snout. They were almost like a German shepherd's ears. I could not understand what I was looking at. I just stared at him for a few minutes. I felt like if I moved, it would see me. It sat there on its butt, with human-looking arms and legs, but with hair or fur covering them. I backed away from the window very slowly and went to tell my husband. He didn't want to get up and go look, because he thought I was imagining it. I went back to the window and it was gone. I don't know or understand what I saw that night, but I did tell my husband and kids what I saw. It has haunted me for many years until I was just telling a few of my grandchildren recently at camp. One of them got on the computer and found some pictures of what they thought I meant. It was so scary. I was looking at the same thing I saw on the roof that night. I could not believe it. As I sit here looking at that picture, I did not know it really existed many, many years ago. Last week I went with a female friend to the Velo Everest in the Netherlands hiking for two days and one night. We had a pretty intense encounter with an unknown cryptid. During the day we gathered during our breaks some lingonberries which are now present in huge quantities. So when we finished hiking on the first day, we had set up our tent somewhere in the middle of the dense forest. We like it that way I suppose and the dark had set in and the only light we had was from a little head torch which we had hung around a branch. We were cooking the lingonberries, not realizing that the scent could attract something. After maybe five minutes of cooking, I heard something a big cryptid move some leaves and already whispered to my friend, we have got company. The sound disappeared for a minute or so and suddenly the most long stretched, deep moaning grunt came out of the blackness, maybe from about 10 to 15 meters or so. The blood froze in my veins but when it repeated a couple of times, I realized that I had to do something because this F wanted to eat from our stuff and maybe fight us for it. So I walked to the nearest bush, rattled it wildly and yelled to the predator that looked like Yeti to get the hell away. A few seconds later, we heard it take of in the most relaxed manner. My friend stepped next to me and I took her hand and places it over my heart region on my chest. It was pounding wildly. It was really intense, and within the next couple of minutes, we decided that we are the cool type of crazy for enjoying this kind of stuff. Around 2007, I used to go hiking in remote parts of India. Once I was visiting a friend of mine working in a very remote village. Back then, the village had no electricity. I have been to this village a couple of times before, it's a long bus journey to reach the nearest road that leads to the village. This road itself is pretty secluded and sees only two buses a day. It's a four mile walk through the fields to reach the village. I got down the bus in the middle of the night. I started walking down the fields to the village. It's a full moon day, so there was enough light to walk without any flashlights. It was a very cold day, but I was feeling dehydrated from the bus journey. I walked to the nearest well in a farm to get some water. Once I finished drinking, I started walking back and looked at a really huge tree nearby, and I was terrified to see a young lady sitting under the tree. With bulged out eyes looking right at me, I was frightened at the sight, but tried to ask aloud what she doing there at that time, but she didn't reply and was just looking at me with no movement. It's a mile from there to the village, and I started running at full speed. When I reached the village, I was running fever, and it took me a day to fully recover from that shock. Later, I have been told that it's a tradition in that village neither to bury nor to cremate a woman when she dies pregnant, but just to leave the body outside the village after a ritual. Was with my dad back in the early 2000s, saw a few things and wasn't sure about others. Creepy with construction, took a detour off 75 going to Lexington, Kentucky around 11 p miss in the summer. Clear night, but once we hit that detour, the whole road got cloudy. Like fog surrounded us. There was a road we took that had only houses on the right side of the road, 
and a huge cornfield as tall as the doors on the left. Weird thing was that every house had candles on their windows. Street lights were working, but there were only two down that road. We came to a dead end and so we turned around. Now I'm facing the cornfields. Swore I saw something tall running in there. The whole route through there, my dad and I stayed quiet until we found a route back to the highway. Dad, that was creepy. Yeah, what the F? Other times I saw a giant shadow moving in an open field while we were unloading. I looked up, nothing, not a single cloud or bird in sight. I've also seen in daylight a silver speck flying incredibly fast in the sky, just with the clouds. No jet stream, no sound. It cleared on half of the city in about 15-20 seconds and halfway through, it just disappeared in a cloud, like it went straight into a cloud and didn't come out. I was just waiting for it to show, but nothing. In the frigid, obsidian depths of the waters off the coast of Somalia, my team of Navy SEALs and I embarked on a mission that would demand every ounce of our training, resilience, and courage. The date etched in my memory was 2023 and our mission was nothing short of dismantling a notorious pirate network, wreaking havoc on international shipping lanes. I belonged to SEAL Team Bravo, a brotherhood of elite warriors whose diverse skills had been meticulously honed through years of grueling training. Among us was Lieutenant Michael Raptor Thompson, our seasoned and battle-hardened leader with a wealth of experience gained from multiple deployments. Our intelligence revealed that the pirate mastermind, codenamed Blackbeard, orchestrated his operations from a coastal village, turning it into a hub for planning and executing hijackings. Our mission directive was clear. Infiltrate the village, neutralize Blackbeard, and extract invaluable intelligence on the pirate network. Under the Shroud of Darkness, we approached the shore in silent, specialized boats, the moonless night providing the cover we needed for the element of surprise. Tension hung in the air as we neared the beach, each member of the team laser focused on the imminent task. Upon reaching the shoreline, we silently disembarked, moving with the stealth and precision that defined our training. Navigating through dense vegetation, we evaded enemy patrols, strategically placing reconnaissance devices to gather real-time intelligence. As dawn's light began to stain the sky, SEAL Team Bravo reached the outskirts of the village. Through night vision goggles, we observed the compound where Blackbeard supposedly hid. Huddled together, we finalized our plan, reinforcing our commitment to the mission and each other. We breached the compound with controlled aggression, swiftly and silently clearing rooms as we advanced toward our target. The air crackled with tension as we encountered armed guards, engaging in close quarters combat with the efficiency of a well-oiled machine. Bullets pierced the air, and the echoes of grenades reverberated through the compound, but we pressed forward. In a climactic moment, Lieutenant Thompson confronted Blackbeard in a room filled with maps, weapons, and stolen goods. A fierce firefight ensued, each shot amplifying the high stakes of the operation. Thompson's training took over, and with calculated precision, he neutralized the pirate leader. With Blackbeard incapacitated, we secured the compound, seizing documents, computers, and communication devices that held valuable insights into the pirate network's operations. As we exfiltrated, destruction trailed in our wake, rendering the pirate network inoperable. Back at the extraction point, SEAL Team Bravo regrouped. Silent boats whisked us away into the ocean's depths, our identities and actions shrouded in secrecy. The success of the mission stood as a testament to the unwavering commitment of my fellow Navy SEALs, who executed our duty with precision, courage, and an unyielding sense of purpose in the face of danger. I was talking on my cell at the end of my sidewalk by the street when I turned around facing my house and saw this huge black human-like bird thing gliding without a noise coming from the east. Maybe the distance would be like three streets over, but about maybe five blocks down. When I saw this I was stunned and stared at it trying to figure out what it was, and then I realized it wasn't anything I've ever seen. I ran into the house and yelled at my husband and my grown son to get out here quick. 
They came but seemed like forever, and they looked and saw it too. When they saw it, the thing was like the a few streets over, and then disappeared behind the big trees. When we saw it, we all said that no one would believe us. But I have recently been talking about it because it has bothered me so much. I've lived in this neighborhood all my life, and I can remember three UFO sightings since I was five, and all the sightings were in this neighborhood or around Stinson Field Airport. I never came forward about them because people think you've lost your ever-loving mind until recently when others I've spoke with shared their experiences. I have other stories, but this one is the most recent, and I was wondering if anyone has ever seen this thing. It is silent like it was a glider, but I could see the body was exactly like a man, a very large man. I live in Sweden and a few years back, I lived with my parents whose house is in a small village in the middle of the woods, so there is plenty of wildlife around. It was in the middle of the winter and pretty much the whole village had gathered at a hut down by the lake to grill and have a nice time. It was about 8 p.m. and it was dark as shit and I wanted to go home and play Skyrim. So I left and began the two kilometer walk home only having my phone to light the path. After one kilometer, I heard something. It was a deep panting. It was way too deep to be a neighboring dog, and I remembered someone mentioning earlier that wolves had been seen near the village. I tried to keep my cool and kept walking in the same pace, trying to spot whatever was running a few meters away from me, breathing loudly, but the light was too weak to spot anything. At this point I was freaking out a little inside and picked up a large tree branch and carried it with me like a weapon, just in case. The thing ran beside me for a hundred meters, then disappeared. When I hadn't heard it for a few seconds, I ran as fast as I could the few hundred remaining meters. I never got to know if it was a wolf, Bigfoot, crawler, or any other cryptid or not. Because it began to snow soon after, covering the tracks. And after checking with the neighbors, I know it wasn't a dog. That's probably the most scared I've ever been. I encountered a huge, brilliant red light while finishing my rounds as a security guard. It hovered above some trees near a construction site. Curiosity compelled me to investigate further, leading me closer to the site. There, I discovered a large saucer-shaped object with a hump in the center bottom section, surrounded by a vibrant red light. As I approached, a low whirring sound reached my ears, and the object descended, landing on a tripod-like gear. To my surprise, a stairway-like protrusion extended towards the ground. A figure emerged from the craft and began descending. The humanoid stood at an impressive height of eight feet with long, dangling arms, a massive torso, and short, stump-like legs. Its face was elongated and oval-shaped, with two tear-shaped eyes that captured my attention. An eerie sensation gripped me as the creature moved towards me with high, loping steps. I felt a strong humming inside my skull and caught a whiff of an odor reminiscent of rotten eggs. Just then, a passing car on the road behind me caught the creature's attention. It abruptly retreated and swiftly boarded the object, which rapidly took off and vanished into the sky. When I was like nine or ten years old, my mother and my grandmother, we all went on a picnic out in the country to this lake. It was getting dark and we decided to leave. My grandmother took the wrong turn and she didn't realize it. We were traveling down this dirt road for a long ways, she realized that we had gone the wrong way and we pulled up to this driveway. By this time it was night and there was a glowing pillar that we noticed off the side of the road. It was like a bluish white pillar and we started driving up closer to it and I remember my mother started screaming, back the car up. And she started beating her hands on the dashboard and we could see that it was an apparition of a woman and it was drifting towards the car. And so we got the heck out of there. All three of us seen it. I, as the witness in this unsettling incident, consider myself a level-headed and respected individual. It was upon returning home that I noticed something peculiar, a bright green, coin-like circle hovering in the air above the refrigerator. 
Initially, I dismissed it as a portable flashlight accidentally left switched on by my wife. However, when I inquired about it, she denied any involvement. My gaze returned to the mysterious green light, and to my astonishment, it seemed to be growing in size and intensity. Suddenly, the object began to move, performing intricate circular motions as it flew around me in a bewildering trajectory. Heat emanated from the light, accompanied by an eerie whistling sound. To my disbelief, the green light expanded further, transforming into the shape of a human-like head. Overwhelmed, I feared that my sanity was slipping away and turned my face to the wall, seeking solace and prayer to Allah. Despite my fervent prayers, when I cautiously glanced over my shoulder, the image persisted before me a humanoid form covered entirely in dense fur, resembling an ape. It stood tall, with powerful shoulders and a muscular physique. Its single eye, positioned in the middle of its forehead, emitted a penetrating red beam, akin to that of a flashlight. The entity lacked a neck, and its head sat squarely atop its robust frame. As the intruder began to float just above the floor, advancing towards the room where my children were peacefully sleeping, panic surged within me. Hastily, I rushed ahead of the entity, reaching my children in time to shield them with my own body. In that harrowing moment, I found solace in prayer once again, beseeching Allah to protect me and my precious children from this hairy monster. The creature floated towards the bed, briefly covering us before picking us up and swiftly placing us back down, unharmed. It then retreated, standing motionless at a distance from the bed. Though the humanoid did not make any threatening gestures, I trembled in sheer horror, hiding my head under the safety of the bed sheets, continuing my earnest prayers. Soon thereafter, the doors creaked and a loud slamming sound echoed through the apartment, awakening my wife. Her presence confirmed the reality of the encounter, as she, too, attested to never experiencing any hallucinations. The memory of that night plagued me, the fear of the creature's return and potential abduction of myself and my children lingering in my thoughts. Eventually, we made the decision to move to another apartment, seeking solace and distance from the haunting events that had transpired. As my wife and I drove through the rain-soaked, isolated area, a peculiar sight unfolded before us. It resembled an accident scene, with numerous flashing lights casting an eerie glow. Intrigued by the commotion, I instinctively slowed down, hoping to offer assistance. As we drew nearer, what we initially mistook for an ambulance revealed itself to be an object resembling a large soda can, lying on its side, propped up by three peculiar legs. Its creamy color took on an otherworldly appearance, accentuated by a vibrant red halo encircling it. The air buzzed with flashing lights emanating from the enigmatic craft. Caught up in our fascination, my wife suddenly let out a blood-curdling scream, jolting my attention away from the object. I turned around to see two figures approaching our car, their presence unnerving. These beings, best described as bug-like, boasted heads reminiscent of praying mantises. Yet their bodies retained a humanoid form, encased in bluish-gray jumpsuits. Fear gripped us as the unimaginable came into focus. Driven by terror, I, armed with a gun, instinctively reached for my weapon and discharged two shots towards the road, hoping to create a deterrent. The sudden commotion seemed to startle the alien figures, compelling them to retreat hastily toward their cylindrical craft, which had landed nearby. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I floored the accelerator, the tires screeching as we raced away from the unfolding scene. As I glanced back in my rearview mirror, my heart sank. Additional humanoid figures, resembling the ones we encountered, gathered around the craft. Their numbers grew to about nine or ten, standing as silent sentinels, while the object remained motionless. We could only imagine the secrets it held, it was a sight that defied explanation, one that etched an indelible mark of disbelief and fear upon our souls. The craft, however, offered us no answers as it stayed rooted to the spot, concealing its mysteries from our bewildered gazes. We escaped its presence, but the encounter left us forever questioning the nature of the unknown, forever wary of the potential truths lurking beyond our comprehension. As I stood atop the Neolithic mound on that crisp, clear afternoon, accompanied by my husband Philip and our eight-year-old son Edward, I anticipated a moment of tranquility and awe. However, my solitude was abruptly shattered when I spotted a group of people approaching the site from the northwest, traversing the adjacent field. At first, there appeared to be around five individuals, with one smaller figure leading the way and the others forming two pairs. 
They marched purposefully towards Bella's nap along the field boundary, dressed uniformly in dark, grayish-black attire. Their pale, oval faces peeked out from beneath pointed hoods, their features translucent and ethereal. They drew nearer, only a few hundred yards away, and my disappointment grew. My attention momentarily wavered as my son Edward demanded my attention. When I looked back towards the approaching group, a jolt of surprise coursed through me. More figures had emerged, joining the procession. I urgently informed my husband, emphasizing that there were now hundreds of people coming our way. Impatiently, I urged him to hurry, for at least a dozen of them seemed to be purposefully advancing towards our location. These new arrivals seemed to materialize from the shadowy recesses of the overhanging evergreen trees and bushes nestled between the two nearby fields. Every figure sported a hood, maintaining a steady pace behind the smaller leading figure. From my vantage point, I deduced that the front figure must have been a child, approximately 12 years old, as they stood only half the height of their companions. Curiously, I could not discern any part of their bodies below knee level, as if they were wading through long, pale dead grass that obscured their lower limbs. They marched in unison, closely hugging the hedge line, never once turning towards their companions. Despite their vigorous stride, they appeared to remain in the same position within the field. Their progress towards the long barrow seemed halted, as if they were traversing a slope, descending into a ditch before ascending on the other side. Growing annoyed by their intrusion, I cast one final glance in their direction before deliberately turning my back and making my way to the opposite end of the mound. Yet, to my disturbance as I reached my destination, they seemed even further away than before, persisting in their resolute advance. I rejoined my son and husband, the latter having completed his photographic endeavors. However, to our surprise, as Philip climbed the mound to take a look, we discovered that the group had vanished without a trace. A sense of unease settled within me, leaving me to ponder the enigmatic encounter. What had transpired on that ancient mound, and where had the hooded figures vanished to? The memory of that day, the inexplicable march of the silent procession, remains etched in my mind, forever a reminder of the mysteries that dwell within the folds of time and space. One of my cousin's brothers told me this story. He works in construction, and he told me a story about three of his friends that he works with. The three guys are Mexican. Of the three of them, one is an older guy. This story takes place east of Flagstaff, Arizona, heading towards Loop. I would say about 20 miles from Flagstaff. There are a lot of cinder cones hills in that area. There's a stretch of H. Igwe that goes down a long hill. The three guys were driving from Flagstaff one night. I don't remember where he said they were going, but it was late and the older man was driving. They started down the long hill. When they were halfway down, they witnessed something very crazy and weird. They saw a centaur half-man or half-horse jump into the center of the road. They said it was very big, at least seven to eight feet tall. It had long hair, and it was carrying a wooden club in one hand. They said it had a very mean-looking evil face. The sight of it freaked them out, and the guy that was driving swerved off the road, and they rolled the truck. They crawled out of the vehicle, and the older guy that was driving was having a heart attack. They called 911, and soon they were taken to Flagstaff Medical Center. They didn't tell anyone about what they witnessed because they feared nobody would believe them. The older man recovered, and they all kept asking each other if they really saw the centaur. They all agreed that they all saw it. They told my cousin about, and he said he went to a Navajo medicine man. He asked the medicine man about it. The man told him that it is true. He said that there are seven centaurs that people have seen over the years. The one that they saw, with the long hair, is the evil one, the mean one. I've heard stories that friends told me when we were kids growing up. I wasn't sure if they were real, but after hearing this I think they are real. My cousin said the three men are still traumatized by the experience, and they said they will never travel again during the night. Anyway, I wanted to share this story with the group. So this happened to my cousin, and not me. He owns a house in the city and his parents live maybe an hour or so away from him on a nice little chunk of property, few acres not incredibly remote, but it's somewhere where people won't usually be driving at night. So I guess he was doing some renos on his house and decided to stay with his parents while the work was being done and so one night, he's driving home and when he's pretty close, he notices a car come up super quick behind him. He moves over a bit so they can pass him, but they don't. As he's getting closer to the house, 
I guess he's starting to freak out a bit, so his plan is to just get home and run inside. So he gets to the start of the driveway, kind of a long country driveway, and another car comes from the other direction and tries to block him. Now he knows something is up, and when he's close to the house, he starts yelling for my uncle to grab his gun, so he makes it inside and locks the door. This is one of those sort of heavy metal doors with no windows, as there's black bears in the area and my uncle comes downstairs, half asleep panicked and ready to shoot whoever is out there the guys get to the door and start like full on trying to kick it down my uncle makes some threats my aunt calls the cops and the guys just kind of leave no idea what the f was going on i'm guessing some kind of a robbery but who knows back in 1988 i lived many miles out in the arizona desert at that time i worked two jobs and a lot of hours each month I worked my schedules out so that I had four days in a row off. During this time I would mess around with my hot rod and race to make a little extra money. I was always doing stuff to my car to improve speed, performance, whatever edge I could get. Well, on one of my days off I installed a new carb and dialed it in. I always took my car out to the desert to test it. On this particular day I had worked until evening, but I took it out for a test anyway. So I was having fun testing her out, and it got dark on me. Instead of trying to get back home, I decided to just stay and sleep in my car. I was just driving around finding a place to park and sleep. I came across this old adobe and decided I'd check it out and sleep. It was kind of small and an old ruin. I found an old fireplace inside, and it looked more comfortable than sleeping in my car. I grabbed a flashlight, turned on my headlights, and gathered a little brush and some small bit of wood. I grabbed a blanket from my car and an old cushion I had for a pillow. So I built a little fire and settled in. In the morning I awoke early, gathered my stuff, and headed back to an old 1950s trailer where I lived. A friend stopped by to visit later in the day. He had lived in that area all his life and was very familiar with the desert there. So he asks, where was I last night since he had stopped by with some whiskey, but you weren't home. So I told him the story of where I was. When I got to the part about the adobe, he listened. Then he asked about the adobe. I told him where it was, and he said that there is no adobe out there. I said, yeah, I slept there. He still said no adobe. So I said, jump in the car, I'll show you. So we drove around and I found the spot, but there was no adobe. My tire tracks were there. I could still see where I built the fire. Everything is there, but no adobe. He's quiet as unconfused, looking around. I said to him that it was here last night. He says that he's been here all his life and knows this desert. There has been no adobe here. He says that I went somewhere maybe into the past, but there isn't no adobe here. He's never seen one here ever in his life. So I don't know what happened that night. I wasn't drunk or high and I know it was there. So I looked for it for years but never found it again. Does anyone out there know what happened that night? This happened when I was 15 years old back in 1979. It doesn't matter how long ago an incident like this occurs because once it does, the trauma burns into your brain. I was at Little Pipe Creek in the small town of Flora, Indiana, where I grew up. It was just a mile or so from where the creek empties into the Wabash River. My friends and I hung out there every day during the summer. It was late afternoon and we had just arrived at our spot. As we approached the creek, I looked up at a tree about 100 feet away, and there is a figure in it. It had long brown hair, and it was swinging from limb to limb, but it was straight up and down, about six feet tall. I'm there with my two other friends. When I notice the figure, I say, what is that? It's not a monkey, but it's swinging like a monkey, but it's not a human either. Back then, we didn't know what Bigfoot was, and this sighting lasted a good five minutes. We're sitting there watching it. I had no fear in me at all. Then, all of a sudden, I just had the most fear I've ever felt in my life, and I told my friends, We gotta go. We have to go right now. I think the Bigfoot or whatever somehow put that sense of fear in me. The sensation was so sudden and strong. So we take off up the nearby hill and head home. I'm going faster than my friends. I'm up in the weeds and I'm scared, and then my friend said, Go, go, go. A man is chasing us. A man is chasing us. I thought he was joking. I looked around at his face, and I've never seen such a look of fear on his face before. We lived about half a mile away, and when we got home, I go, a guy was chasing us, he goes. Well, it looked like a man, but it was big and hairy. 
We were scared to return to the spot, but a few weeks later we gathered our courage and walked back to the creek. When we got there, it looked like a bomb had gone off. Several of the small and medium-sized trees were uprooted and tossed into the creek. But the first thing we noticed as we approached was the unmistakable odor of decay and death. We looked at the destruction as we stood several yards away from the creek. That is when we noticed the source of the stench. There were at least three deer carcasses and several small dead animals strewn throughout the site. We were getting ready to leave after only a few minutes. Then I started to again feel a strong and sudden urge to run from the area. That's when we heard a horrific scream coming from the surrounding woods. We instinctively ran toward home. That was the last time that I ever went back to the location. Several years later, after I had moved away, I ran into one of my friends who had experienced the incident with me. He stayed in Flora, got married, and built a house. He told me that the big hairy man had been seen and reported along Little Pipe Creek by other witnesses. So I don't typically believe this kind of stuff, but I had a strange encounter a while back that I was telling my coworker about, and they insisted I saw a rake. I've been doing some research since I had no idea what it was, and it looks very similar to what I saw. Anyway, I was driving home from work at 1.30 a.m. about two months ago and was heading down this typically busy side street, except since it was late there wasn't a lot of traffic, just a jeep in front of me. As I was driving around a bend in the road, I saw in my peripheral this figure to my right by the sidewalk standing between two small trees held up by wire supports. The creature was standing kind of behind them. At first I thought it was just a big slender dog, like a white greyhound or Great Dane that escaped and seemed to be standing and barking at traffic by the sidewalk. I only noticed it as I began to pass by. As I passed by though, I quickly noticed it appeared to have a humanoid-shaped head with black eyes, a hunched back posterior, and a long stretched mouth like it was screaming. I was going about 45 miles per hour when I passed, and it was dark out. I thought to myself, yo WTF was that? So I slowed down quickly to look back, and in my mirror I saw the creature turn around and run towards a wood fence, but as it ran I saw how tall and slender the creature was. It seemed pale with a kind of anorexic appearance. It moved strangely and its leg joints were inverted and bent the opposite direction. At that point I was seriously creeped out. The jeep in front of me also slowed down, so I could only assume they saw it too. We both kept driving as it was late and couldn't stop in the middle of the road, but that situation really made my skin crawl. I kept checking my mirrors for the rest of the drive home and debating if I should have called a non-emergency line to have an officer check it out, but I told myself they would think I was an idiot. Now every night when I take that road, I look around to see if I can spot an agent. I really want to believe it was just a dog, but I can't stop thinking about how strangely it moved with its backwards knees. I haven't talked about this much except to my co-worker because quite frankly it sounds ridiculous. I'm just wondering WTF I actually saw, and if it's something I should even be talking about, or if I should continue to pretend I never saw anything and just move on with my life. My great-grandfather did trucking for a while. I also know quite a few drivers. I might do it eventually. I've heard anything from guys being hopped up on Red Bull or Monster Energy and seeing a quote, pink piggy with a tutu dancing in the street in the middle of the night. Whenever anyone saw that it was time to pull off and go to bed, no matter how stretched for time you were. A relative of mine saw some 60-foot icicles somewhere in Virginia. I honestly don't remember where it was. Probably one of the most dangerous was when me and my dad were waiting for a delivery, and it was just after 4.45 a.m. At this point, and the driver called my dad and said he'd hit a power line just down the road. Me and my dad hopped in the car to check on the guy, he's a friend, and he said some hillbilly-looking guy missing a fee teeth came out of nowhere and said, Oh, you ain't got nothing to worry about, that's just a cable line. Cable meaning telephone internet. The guy picks up the line with his bare hands and pulls it off the road and walks off. That was just weird. I don't know if that's what you guys are looking for, but that's the weirdest stuff I got. I work as a broadcast engineer. One night in September 2015, I received a phone call around 9.30, 10-ish p.m. from the on-duty engineer that our OTA over the air signal had gone out, and we were off the air on our OTA platform. The call was with several other engineers as well as my boss at the time. 
We figured out that the problem was at our transmitter and must be corrected manually. My boss asked for someone to volunteer to go with him, and after a few seconds of awkward silence I offered. So our RF transmitter site was located on top of Beacon Mountain in Beacon, New York which was about an hour plus from our station. At the time, I had never been up there so going in the middle of the night was a little spooky. I met my boss and we drove together, got to the mountain a little before midnight. The road up the mountain to the transmitter site is a long, narrow, windy and steep dirt road with a lot of big loose rocks, so the drive up and down is scary enough. I can't emphasize enough how dark this drive was. Like pitch black. A few times while going up we would see headlights coming towards us of people out with their off-road jeeps. Which wouldn't be as weird if it weren't the middle of the night. We also saw two different campfires deep in the woods, which I just assumed were groups of locals hanging out drinking. My boss told me that locals hung out near the transmitter site sometimes and should be avoided as they had a tendency to be sketchy. It didn't seem too sketchy to me, but what did I know, it was my first time there. My boss also told me that he never travels to that mountain without a gun. He said it's more than the locals. I've seen stuff out here I can't really explain. We get to the top, do our work on our transmitter, close everything up, and start to head back down. As we were heading down, we were at a particularly steep part of the road when you have to ride your brake, because the car won't stop till the incline levels out a little. All of a sudden, three deer sprint out in front of us, not even looking at our oncoming car, causing us to swerve since we were already riding the brake. The front of the car hit a rock which stopped our momentum. My boss instantly turned the car off and once the sound of the engine died, we heard something big run the opposite direction away from the road up the natural slope of the hill. I shined my flashlight in the direction, but whatever it was, was already out of sight. We could still see branches moving and leaves settling from being disturbed by whatever ran away. I asked my boss if he thought that was another deer or possibly a bear and he replied, Bears run on all fours, whatever that was ran on two legs. And bears don't hunt deer, something was chasing them. When we first heard the footsteps, I would estimate they were as close as 10-15 feet from the car when it started to run away but appeared to be standing over us as there was a natural incline up the mountain. There are a few logical explanations like that my boss was just trying to scare me or that it was a local walking, running through the woods, but here are a few things to consider. Yes, it could have been a person walking alone through the woods, but why chase the deer? And why run away from the car? Also, whatever ran away was out of sight quickly, like within three, four seconds of starting to run up the hill. This person would have to be in the greatest shape ever to run that quickly up this hill. This also sounded way too big to be a bobcat, mountain lion, or coyote. My boss is not the kind of guy that would try to scare people. He's a very stern, all-business type of guy. He seemed pretty rattled by this and wanted to get off the mountain ASAP. He later confided in me that he thought it may have been a Bigfoot. I ended up going back up that mountain many more times before leaving for a new job, and I never saw or heard anything like that night. However, I never went back after sunset. I no longer work for this company, and this company no longer owns the transmitter site, so I will likely never have a reason to go back. I don't know of any reported sightings or experiences in the area, but I do know that over the years there have been many car accidents on that road. I assume all the accidents are due to the poor condition of it, but honestly, I have no idea. The year was 1970. I worked for Caltrans as a right-of-way agent for the state of California. I was taking some legal documents over to Bakersfield to have a county judge sign. I was traveling on Route 58 west of Mojave towards Bakersfield and east of Tehachapi in my 1957 Chevrolet state car. A state highway maintenance crew was repairing the westbound lanes. Traffic was stopped in these two lanes for up to 15 minutes. I pulled right off of the highway to a dirt and gravel turnout and backed up to a low-level brush and rock area with no dirt roads behind me. I sat in the car for a few minutes and decided to take a look at the documents I was taking to Bakersfield for the judge. Before I got the documents out, I noticed something in my rear view's mirror and turned to see what it was. I was amazed to see a vehicle directly behind my car with two individuals wearing gray-white suits. Mine was the only car on the turnout. No car could have possibly gone around the front or the back without me seeing or hearing it. There was no sound at all. I continued to look directly at the car and individuals directly through the back window. The car was maroon in color with a dark top. The grille looked similar to an older Buick. 
The license plate was light in color with no discernible markings. The two individuals in the car, as stated, wore jump-type suits with no buttons. They were slender with no visible hat or hair, and their bodies appeared to be smaller than the average-sized man. Their eyes were very dark and semi-oval, little larger than a normal human. They stared at me and never blinked. They both had two small holes for their nose, very small mouths, no lips, and I couldn't see any ears. Nor could I see their arms due to their car hood hiding over half of their bodies. After a few minutes of staring at each other, I noticed light traffic starting to slowly move on the highway again to the west. So I drove from my parking area out to the paved highway going towards Backersfield again. The highway's westbound lanes were now open for the public. I was driving about normal speed in the right-hand lane, just west of where the state construction was. Looking to my left, I saw a maroon car driving at my speed, parallel to me with the same individuals I had seen at the turnout. The driver looked continuously to the front. I immediately noticed that he had no nose and he was bald. The passenger in the car was again staring directly at me. We drove parallel to each other for about 15 seconds. I didn't know what to do, so I waved my hand at them as if to say goodbye. They immediately sped down the highway and disappeared around a moderate curve to the right. I sped up to try and see the maroon car again, but it had disappeared. There were rather steep rock cliffs on the right side and no place to turn off the highway. The next day, driving from Bakersfield to Bishop, I stopped at the same turnout of my first encounter and went to the same spot. I saw my tire tracks from the previous day, but saw no other tracks behind mine. Wow, as you might deduce, I've never breathed a word of these happenings for decades to anyone for fear of being ridiculed. I've mulled over this experience many times over the years. This is my true story of a very strange, mysterious, and profound event. Lately, I've been seeing a lot more stories on Reddit about Yaoi sightings and encounters. So, I myself was driving home one evening and saw something that disturbed me to my core. Myself and two fellow officers were driving down this country road towards the station. It was maybe right about one in the morning after a very long shift. The roads can be pretty dangerous sometimes, and we're always on high alert for anything out of the ordinary. We spotted something up ahead near an old abandoned building, so we slowed down to see what it was. It was the movement that caught our eye. As we got closer, I realized it was not any animal we'd ever seen. It was tall, bipedal, hairy, with big eyes, and had claws like a bear. But it clearly was not a bear. But like a bear, it also stood upright. It was just standing there, looking right at us. It did not have any clothes on either, so I was pretty rattled. We pulled up about several hundred feet away, stopped to get a better look at it. We knew this wasn't one of the new aliens they're always talking about. This was something else. Though I will admit, we're all fairly seasoned officers, this thing really spooked us. Enough that one of my fellow officers turned around right then, drove off without saying anything to me or my other friend. He must have had his reasons that he took off. While we were still in the process of trying to find out what happened, this thing began making strange sounds. We tried to get a closer look, but we felt too afraid to get closer. I feel like had we gotten out of the car and gone up the hill to where this was, whatever that thing was, it would have attacked us. Was it a yaoi? It just had this sort of dangerous demeanor about it. So we decided to leave it. Instead, I'm kind of glad my partner took off. I think he knew something I did not back then. I know for sure now though. Cryptids are real, and yaoi is one of them for sure. In fact, my childhood friend saw another one years ago in the forest near his home. Once we were young teenagers, he's been trying to convince me ever since that all those other stories we've heard are probably true. I guess we know that he was right about at least some of them. I don't know what's going on, but I'm glad to see there are others out there like me and my friend who believe in these creatures and are not afraid to speak out about it. It's time we get the word out that they are real. People need to recognize this kind of thing is happening every day all around us, even if most people can't see it or just simply refuse to accept it. That and stop perpetuating the stories and rumors about Sasquatch and Bigfoot being demons or something. We know better than that by now, right? I'm Akita, Sioux native that had this terrifying encounter with an unknown predator. So I grew up in the heart of the Appalachians, near a dense and mysterious woodland. My closest companion in this wilderness was Red Bull, a fearless and adventurous friend who shared my curiosity for the unknown. One fateful day, after a successful bison hunt, 
Red Bull and I decided to venture deeper into the woods in search of the carcass we had left behind. As we made our way through the underbrush, a sudden chill swept through the forest, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand on end. I exchanged a wary glance with Red Bull, both of us sensing an eerie presence lurking nearby. The familiar sounds of the woods seemed to fade into an unnatural silence. Then we saw it. Emerging from the darkness was a figure unlike anything we had ever encountered. It stood tall on its two hind legs, its elongated arms brushing against the ground like a bear in disguise. The creature's gaunt frame gave an impression of extreme malnourishment, with a crooked spine that contorted its form. Its face was a grotesque sight, lacking the majestic horns of a bull, but adorned with a tangled mane of neck hair. Its skin, bathed in the ethereal glow of moonlight, shimmered with a haunting gray hue, and its eyes glowed with an unnatural, piercing light. My heart pounded in my chest as I locked eyes with this monstrous cryptid. Its presence sent a shiver down my spine, and I could feel the weight of its gaze penetrating my very soul. In sheer terror, Red Bull and I turned and ran for our lives. Our pounding footsteps echoed through the forest, accompanied by the echoing howls of the creature in pursuit. It seemed relentless, its unearthly speed closing in on us. But just as it drew dangerously close, an inexplicable change came over the creature. It abruptly ceased its pursuit, losing interest in our escape. Breathless and trembling, we reached the safety of our tribe's encampment. We dared not speak of what we had witnessed, fearing that our story would be met with disbelief or worse, that it would invite the creature's return. We sought solace in each other's silence, yet the memory of that nightmarish encounter haunted our thoughts. I never really talked about this, but 1968. I was on an ambush patrol out of a fire base in Vietnam. We used to go out at night like an Indian raiding party and basically try to F up the resupply of the Vietnamese around our area. We had a few players in the fight, including the howitzers of the fire base and the spooky gunships. We would use both for backup when things got sticky. We also could call movers, which were Mustangs and F4 or Thunder Chiefs to run a hot nape, napalm drop on our numbers. So we were out playing in the woods chasing Charlie and harassing his pack animals, and we see the mother load bicycle tracks. They were deep and wide bikes were carrying a hell of a load, and the edges were different so it was many bikes in step. Sweet time to party. So I won't lie about it we used to smoke a lot of grass, and it was mostly drizzled with opium. I was 19 in a weird hostile country for reasons I didn't get, killing people I had no reason to kill so you would do drugs too. We smoked up on a squat and set out to kill anything that moved. We had Spooky flying in to help as soon as we let him know the pan was hot. Spooky would circle us and dump lead rain into the woods. Spooky runs were like calling in a flying chainsaw. Everything got cut to bits and usually if a weed and a stick was left standing then the enemy got lucky. We heard the trail going live and knew we had a great ambush spot. The smell hit me it was wrong. Usually in the wet jungle you smell the odor of men. Urine and cigarettes and candles that the Vietnamese used to guide their way. Those were normal smells, rice and sweet milk smells, things like that were okay. This was not okay. It almost smelled like rotten meat. More dense and concentrated than any smell should have been, a few of us picked up on it. We dumped our fire in and took return fire, back and forth as usual. The spot we picked was a huge slow bend where the trail went uphill and was basically protected by a 12 to 15 foot wide band of brush and trees and then a dirt hill behind it, nowhere to run or hide. Lights kept coming down toward us and we kept shooting, noise and movement got lead on it. It was crazy they just kept coming to the spot. Spooky came in did her job and the band of trees was gone. The whole trail was open no way Charlie could survive any of this. So many rounds screamed into the hill. We sat on the spot till morning the sun came up and we went up to do our body count. Pointless because they dragged off the dead so you guessed based on heel marks and drips of blood, not a single body. No drags, no evidence, a single thing had been there. Bullet holes and trees chewed up. Not a single thing to show we had hit anything. We all agreed we saw something. We all agreed we saw no evidence of humans dead or otherwise. So about a week later guys on patrol call and a fast mover strike to napalm the same area. No bodies, no marks, nothing. In talking about it, we all discovered that we had the same smell experience, the dead rotten meat smell. I think this happened about four times where napalm and gunships tore the place apart and never was anything found. No dropped gear, no blood. 
Nothing like poof, they were gone. We saw soldiers, we saw bikes and boxes and bags It was there. I can't explain it and I can't offer a thought. I know what I saw and smelled and felt I just can't tell you where they went. The hill was heavily bombed, CO thought maybe a tunnel complex ran under and the tunnels were used as an escape route. That doesn't work in my mind. Napalm is as indiscriminate of a killer as one can get. Even if you were standing ready to jump in a tunnel, napalm is still going to melt your lungs. I got some shrapnel in my calf and shin another night, so I never had an ambush on that trail area again. But as far as I know, it was never explained. Being set out like that, even with a bunch of guys, we were still basically alone and had to live with the rules of the jungle. Monkeys and cats and things like that mess with your mind. This was different. You felt nothing the whole. I feel him looking at me wasn't part of it. None of us felt afraid or sensed something different than any ambush. It just happened. So it was my junior year of college and every year around October or November my girlfriend's sorority would have a function called the Great Outdoors. Every girl in the sorority invites a date and things usually get pretty rowdy 125 plus people. Anyways, the location of this event changes each year. This year, we were set to go about two hours from campus to a secluded camping ground that was in Missouri. We all attended the University of Arkansas, which is in the Ozark Mountains and close to the MO border. So we left for this function late in the afternoon and didn't take the exit for the campground until the sun was beginning to set. After taking the exit, we were told to follow signs that the sorority had set up along the way to get us to the campsite. Easy enough, they were all in bright pink and just indicated when and where to turn. We had been following these signs for about 45 minutes when I realized it had been about 20 minutes since we had seen our last sign that indicated a turn. With that being said, the dirt road we were on was getting more and more into the depths of the woods and the, you could tell that this road had been way less traveled on than any of the others we had been on. A few minutes go by, I start to get worried but don't want to freak out the girls in the car so I just sit back and keep looking for pink signs. Finally, we stumble upon a sort of hidden house that was not hidden in the woods, but definitely didn't stand out. The dirt road dead ended at the house, and the only way to turn around would be to pull up close to the house where there was small patch of gravel. We were in a four-door, non-four-wheel drive car. Upon pulling up toward the house, I see two three men standing off the side of the road, still hidden in the dark, yet visible all with what seemed to be Kevlar vest on and what looked like sub-automatic guns. I own eight guns and would say they resembled a UMP-45. I immediately tell my buddy to stop the car and put it in reverse. He does not. He continues to drive up towards the house to turn around. Obviously, he had not noticed the guns. He rolls down the window and explains the situation, now obviously seeing the guns. The man told us that he wasn't sure where we were headed, but the road dead ends here and that we best get headed in the other direction before things start to get scary for us. Needless to say, we screamed out of there. Girls were crying. Upon rolling out, me and the other guy noticed about 20 propane tanks on the side of the house. They were definitely cooking a lot of meth. It was the most hills have eyes experience I have ever had. I lived in Mexico. It's a decent part of Mexico, close to the border, minimal crime, and it's silent 99% of the time. The issue is that my family couldn't afford a telephone and the nearest hospital was across the border. We were near the beach so the rain would get pretty wicked. My grandmother always told us to run inside when it rained or the owls will get you. She then proceeded to lock the steel gate and the solid wood door with four different locks. One day I asked, what were the owls? She simple went stone-faced. I have never seen anything but a nice smile or the lip quiver of worry from her, so as a kid, my heart sank. She didn't give me an answer. Later that week, a storm hit and I played out by the sea. She said, hurry, the owls will make you weak to the ocean and take you away. I, being a punk that I was, stayed and splashed some more. She simply started walking away. I freaked out and followed. She was old, so she couldn't run, but even I had trouble keeping up. The rain hit us and she locked the doors and prayed. I'm sorry. Later that night as we were walking upstairs and I saw something that warped what I thought was normal. Two shadows on the walls. One short and stubby and one long and scrawny, no bigger than a child. Their size didn't make sense. They had such. Small twisted figures and the worst part. I couldn't see them. 
I could only witness their shadows. I couldn't tell if they were inside or had been locked out. I instinctively held my grandmother's hand and stared to where I thought they were. My grandma moved my head so I looked forwards. The more you see, the more they see you. I slept in her bed that night. To this day, I still see twisted shadow figures. Less often sure, but others can see them too. They simply look past the shadows and pass it off as an illusion. I can't be in the ocean for more than 13 minutes without my body weakening. I tried to prove it to some friends, and they had to carry me out of the water because I couldn't support my own weight. You can choose to believe me or not, but that secluded part of Mexico. It was the scariest place I ever visited. I have seen a dogman multiple times. The first time was when I was a child growing up in Alabama. My brother and I both saw it. It was about six feet tall, standing on its back legs, and had a face like a wolf. Dark fur and reddish eyes. Saw it multiple times that summer, but never as close. A few years later, I saw it peering into my window while I was trying to fall asleep. My parents never believed me, of course, but I insisted on changing rooms and always kept the blinds shut. The last time I saw one was when I was about 22 hiking with a group of friends. We were about four miles from the trailhead and I needed to take a piss. They kept hiking as I am generally faster than them and knew I would catch up. When I was done with my business and turned around, I saw the same head peeking from behind a tree. Camping in the Sierra Nevadas a few weeks back when that wildfire was going on up at Wishon. Wake up at 2 a.m. for no reason, lay my head back down and close my eyes until I hear blood-curdling screams echoing through the hills. I'm talking like the kind of sound that you never want to hear come from a human, kind of high-pitched and lots of fluctuation in it, like how your own voice cracks when you're yelling as loud and as hard as you can. This went on for like a minute and a half, two minutes, somewhere in there. So at the time I'm thinking that I'm hearing someone being attacked by a bear or something, but I was probably just hyping myself up over what was more than likely a fox or a big cat. But still, that was creepy as hell. Oh yeah, and that same night before going to bed, I heard twigs being stepped on just outside of our campsite, maybe 20 yards out in the woods. I kept listening, and when it didn't stop, I grabbed a flashlight and waved it through the trees, and I could have sworn that I saw something duck behind a tree. But I'm willing to admit that this was more than likely my mind playing tricks on me. I live out pretty far north in Canada, British Columbia. I lived in a place called Prince Rupert for a few years, small population of 5,000 and very wooded also right by the ocean. I was DD for my friends a few years back, and we were driving along the highway around midnight. The part of the highway we were on was very wooded. Now I was sober since I was the driver. I noticed a figure off the side of the road. It kind of looked like a bear, but very large even for a grizzly. As we approached this creature, stood on its hind legs and looked at us approaching. It ran a few steps along the side of the road, then went into the thick forest. My hair was standing on end, and I had goosebumps everywhere absolutely shocked. Now my friends were no shape to collaborate what I saw, but I believe I saw Bigfoot. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.